Good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting in 2024 of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee and I remind all members and witnesses to ensure that the devices are on silent. We are uh, joined by Megan Gallagher, MSP and Fulton McGregor online today and Mark Griffin will be joining us shortly. And the first item on our agenda to, is to decide whether to take items 4, 5 and 6 and 7 in private. Are members agreed? agreed. We're all agreed. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is to take evidence on the housing inquiry from two panels of witnesses. And these sessions are an opportunity for the committee to look at the response to the housing emergency, as well as considering how we move beyond the housing emergency to a sustainable housing system that works for all in Scotland. And we're joined on our first panel this morning by Chris Burt, who's the Associate Director for Scotland at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Professor Ken Gibb, who's the director at the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence at the University of Glasgow, and Professor Christian Hilber, who is at the Department of Geography and Environment at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And I welcome the witnesses to the meeting, and we're gonna, now going to turn to questions uh, from members. We're going to have around 75 minutes for this session and have quite a lot of ground to cover. So I'd be grateful if witnesses and members, uh, if witnesses can keep their responses concise and members again also your questions. And we'll try to direct questions to specific witnesses where possible. But if you would like to come in, please indicate this to the clerks or myself. And there's no need for you to turn your microphones on and off as we will do that for you. Um, so I'm going to begin by asking a number of general scene setting questions. So I'd be interested to hear from you, what you, from your perspective, what constitutes a housing emergency? So we can just understand and kind of get that as a baseline for our discussion. So maybe I'll just start with Chris and work across. So Chris, what's your perspective on a housing emergency? Sure, thanks, Kavina. I'll just quickly declare an interest. I'm also a director of Aberfeldy Development Trust, and we focus on social housing within that setting. But to be very clear, I'm here with my JRF hat on. Great, thank um, you. I mean, in terms of the emergency, I mean, I, d I don't think it's hard to see it, to be honest. I think you just need to look at the, the homelessness statistics, which are you know published regularly. We see record numbers of, of open homelessness cases. You know, the numbers of people in temporary accommodation are are really quite shocking and I think um, you know this, this city embodies a lot of a lot of those issues as well and I think one factor from this city which I think is particularly striking is that the average time that a child spends in temporary accommodation in Edinburgh is 507 days I mean anybody who's spent any time around young children know that the importance and the difference between being four and a quarter and you know five and three quarters is incredibly important we are stealing parts of children's childhood mm -hmm. by locking them in temporary accommodation. If, if that's not an emergency, I don't know what is. OK, thanks very much. Ken, any other things to add to that? Yeah, uh, yes, I think so. I mean, first of all, uh, it's different in different places. Uh, I have a colleague who's recently worked for a Gile and Butte Council looking at uh, the dimensions of emergency as they perceived mm -hmm. it, which has a lot to do with the private rented sector in a, in a rural context. Uh, it's clearly very different if you look at the central belt in Glasgow and Edinburgh in, in, in particular. Uh, I agree with Chris. It's, it's pretty apparent that there are a lot of dysfunctional things occurring in, 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 in our housing systems. And, and the case for there being a national emergency, I think the simplest way of reflecting on that is adding up, really. I think slightly more than half of the Scottish population live in local authorities that have declared a housing emergency. So so for me, it's about different kinds of dysfunction that exist uh, in places and and clearly thinking about what do you do to, 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 to turn that around on a stable, sustainable mm -hmm. basis. You mentioned dysfunction. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yes. Uh, I mean, I think... So uh, we used to... Uh, uh, assess and design what was called local housing systems analysis, which used to be the evidence base for local housing strat strategies. And we, we took that 
basis as the notion of, of, of a well-functioning housing system, which would have certain long-term characteristics, which would be complementary and, and fit uh, together. And really, it's where you see significant imbalances that are taking you away from that. That you're going to get, you're going to get some negative uh, so, so, sorts of outcomes. Ho homelessness, uh, very high demand in places, very low low demand in, in other pla 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 places. Affordability consequences, all all of those so sorts of things, but much more as well. A sense that there isn't enough supply, or supply is unstable. You know, this might be mm. in the private sector and volatile or whatever. So, there there are many of these different things, and they interconnect and, and uh, they reinforce each other. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the job of the evidence base for a housing strategy is to try to think through what you need to do to try to, uh, over a period of time, move your system onto a trajectory which is more uh, stable, efficient, fairer, etc. OK. Thanks very much. Christian, anything to add? Yes. So, I would say there are two components to uh, housing and affordability. So, one is... Uh, the financial burden that uh, housing causes. The second one is the fraction of the population that is not in permanent housing, so those who are uh, effectively homeless. And so just looking at the, the, the statistics and the numbers, Scotland does not look good when it comes to the financial burden. Actually, it looks better than England. Um, but when we look at the homelessness statistics, it's really quite shocking to see um, what the fraction of the population is that is not in permanent housing. And mm -hmm. so to give some perspective, Financial Times recently uh, did a report on homelessness and the UK was um, by far the country with the highest share of homelessness amongst all OECD countries. And I I did some, you know, back of the envelope calculations, and ba based on that, Scotland actually looks slightly worse than than England. Okay. Uh, just one more thing to add: there are very large spatial differences in housing and affordability, and part of the problem is that there are areas within the country where um, inaffordability is is a is a huge problem. Okay, then maybe we'll get to uncover a bit more of, the, of that um, as we go on. So my next question was, do you agree that there's a national housing emergency in Scotland? Um, but I, I, I think I'm getting from what you've said that you, you, you do agree um, that there is one. Um, but um, do you think that the, the Scottish Government is clear about how it has defined, this, defined it? Do you think that they're defining it in the same way that you are defining it? Um, I, mean, I think, as I say, I wouldn't get too hung up on how you define it because, it, in particular bits of Scotland, you know, you, you just kind of have to be within the community to see it. So mm -hmm. I think it's more important to think about, well, how do we know when we're out of it? Yeah. How can we, what are the key things that need to change to ensure that we have moved out of that emergency? And I think that will help define some of the key actions. And I, and I don't think that the Scottish Government have done that yet. Okay. I mean, I, I think they are trying to. I've, I've been in discussions with them about what that will look like. But I think that would be a, an immediate good first step. So you know, how you do that, I think, is, is, is up for debate. I think the experts in, in local government and RSLs and working with the Scottish Government should be at the forefront of making that decision. But I do think it would help for us to put kind of milestones in the ground so that people know what they're pushing towards. Things like the temporary accommodation numbers okay. are an obvious example. Great. That's great. Well, I think we've got some questions later on about defining it, so I'll, I'll let colleagues come in with that. Um, just, again, um, Christian, you pointed out the, um, the percentage of the population not in permanent housing in terms of Scotland and the Financial Times report you referenced is, uh, I think you used the word, shocking. Um, so that's one aspect. I just wonder if, uh, Ken or Chris, you've got any other sense around how Scotland's position compares with the rest of the UK? Anything to add to what Christian said? I guess only, only to say that uh, 
that's not quite apples and apples that we're looking at. The, the, clearly, the legislation and requirements are different, and it works in kind of different different, different ways. The, obviously, we have we have a different set of rights that, that, that people have stronger set of rights, and that has implications. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, other things being equal, you you could well have higher recorded homelessness because the rights are being affected. But but more more specifically, also uh, that there are. There are, there are laws and, and legislation in England and Wales which are currently probably superior to things in Scotland, such as this, the current pre prevention uh, uh, policy. Obviously, that's changing here. OK, that's really helpful. So it's not necessarily useful for us to compare with the rest of the UK because of the different legislation. and should certainly be aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. Chris. I think there are, there are a couple of things to say in this. I mean, we've done analysis in the past which shows that one of the reasons that child poverty levels in particular are lower in Scotland than they are elsewhere in the UK is because of the relative affordability of housing. Now, that is different in different bits of Scotland, but generally is true. I mean, I think there are a couple of things to reflect on in that. It's that, A, we were making that argument to underline the importance of investing in social housing in particular, because the difference between England and Scotland at the turn of a millennia in terms of um, affordability of housing was not that different. It doesn't take long if you stop investing in housing for that to flip, and that's what's happened all across England. And I think it's, that's a salutary warning, but I think there is something about comparative studies of the fact that there may be more or less homeless people in in Bradford as of no um, no help to somebody who's homeless in Bathgate. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so, uh, a final question in this kind of general area: Do you think we could have predicted that this housing emergency was coming? And we were kind of talking about the need. For, I think you were just talking there, Chris, about the need for affordable housing and things like that. Um, but yeah, could we have predicted it? Ken, um, I'm, uh, getting some thoughts together there. Yeah, I'm just, I, I'll, I, to some extent, yes, I suppose. Uh, particularly where there, there's clearly market imbalance, mm -hmm. and strong imbalance, where demand is greater than, 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 than supply. Uh, even, even building, you know, 10,000 units of social and affordable housing a year is, is, a, is still, I've said this before, it's a tiny, tiny amount compared to the stock and, and it's not doing you know, necessarily much to resolve the imbalances that we have in the private rented sector. Uh, however, I mean, so, so some of the things that have happened which have led to where, where we are over the last few, few years could be argued to be to some extent self-inflicted. You know, they, they, they are some of the unintended consequences of well-intentioned policies that, that have no con con consequences, particularly when there's other things going on like COVID and uh, cost of living crises and such like. Okay, anybody else? Could we have predicted it? Christian? Yes, I, I would argue it, it, it is predictable. I mean, I'm, I'm an expert mostly on England, on the English housing crisis, which is, is uh, perhaps even more severe than the Scottish one. And I would argue that in the case of England, it has been a crisis that has been in the doing, not just for years, but for decades. Um, so th there's certain components that are more recent, uh, last couple of years, COVID, perhaps Brexit. Um, but um, the, the issues are kind of institutional. Um, it relates to the planning system. It relates to the tax system and um, Essentially, there is not enough incentives to build in uh, the UK, and as a consequence, uh, demand far outstrips supply, and housing construction has been going down over the last few decades, whereas demand has been increasing. And that inevitably leads to a housing crisis sooner or later. And I think we have reached that point. We have reached that point a couple of years ago in, in England uh, where it is, has become a national crisis. OK, thanks, Chris. Yeah, and I would just add to that, yeah, there were some unpredictable elements to it, COVID, you know, inflation that's followed that, rising construction costs, etc. But I do think this is kind of baked in. I mean, this has been baked in by the 
the failure of the right to buy and the, the failure to replace stock within the social system. Um, but I, I do think we, we also have to look at other things which have happened in the same period. We have seen the withering of the social security system for particular single person households. We've seen the failure of local housing allowance to keep up with rents. We have seen the shift from the social sector into the, the PRS sector, which tends to be less secure. And so I think it is predictable. I mean, this parliament has predicted parts of it. There are reports of the cross-party group on housing to 2040 before the last election. You know, CIH and SFHA have done regular kind of assessments of what's what's needed to happen. And if those haven't happened, we've, we've kind of baked in these issues. So perhaps some of the severity and things like home office decisions in Glasgow have certainly not helped over the last year or so, but I, I do think there, this is, was fairly predictable. OK, thanks very much. I'm also saying that we've had some very long-term trends that are, that are unhelpful, so the, the very long-term shift from supply subsidy to demand sub subsidy were something like 88% 88, 88 of all subsidy in the housing system is, is demand-side and largely housing benefit. That, that becomes a real block and change. Uh, it, it, it's made worse by the, the known fitness for purpose of some of the housing benefit dimensions that Chris has just been talking about, which goes back to 2008-9 and, and, and the period a, a, after that. So th that's a difficult place to be, and it's also a difficult thing to unravel and, and, and put, put back, back together. It's mm -hmm. probably a, a generational job to do that, actually, uh, to try and get the balance better between supply and demand. Uh, subsidy. So, so that's a very long-term sense. And, and Christian's absolutely right. You know, you you have a number of these long-term structural things that that make the system much less, much more volatile and unstable. And, and with enough things coincide, you're going to have a lot of things going going wrong. But it's uh, it's 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 likely to happen. But it's difficult to predict because mm. of the other things too. Okay. Thanks for that. I'm going to bring in Emma Roddick in this area. Thank you, Convener. Um, just before I get to my question, I wonder, um, Professor Gibb, earlier on you said um, that there have been unintended consequences from well-intentioned policies. I wonder if you could just be specific on that. Well, I mean, what, one example would be the rent freeze, I guess, uh, two year, years ago. It clearly had a, a very positive uh, affordability benefit to existing tenants, but because of the way it was designed, it, it meant that... Uh, New, new tenants didn't get any of that benefit. People mm. moving in the system didn't get any of that benefit. And uh, that led to, for new tenancies, rents rising extremely strongly. And it also led to uh, the withdrawal of institutional investment. I think yeah, that's generally agreed that that's, that's what ha happened. So that that's, that hasn't helped the rental sector. It hasn't helped large groups of people in or potentially in the private rental sector who are, who are often not given the same weight of concern as existing tenants are for mm. understandable re reasons, but it's that, you know, that long-term uh, negative effect. And, and how do we learn from that then? Is it, is it necessary to have caps in between tenancies? No, I think, well, I think we, there's a broader lesson, which is about thinking really hard about how you design rent control policy and thinking really hard about how it interacts with wider housing systems, social security, labour markets, mm -hmm. other things, other things like that. And, and you know, uh, trying, trying, to, try, trying to create the, the best kind of set, set of outcomes for what you're trying to achieve. Uh, so I, I, think, I think it's, mu it's much more than just whether it's in between tenancies and new tenancies. It's about sunset clauses and it's about what complementary things are happening, like the social and affordable housing supply programme alongside it. Great. Thank you. Um, kind of to the, the whole panel then, um, from what you've seen based on those who have declared housing emergencies, whatever um, language they've been using, does that directly impact the behaviour and approaches of politicians and officials working within different levels of government? I don't know, Chris, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. I mean... I think my insight would be most at the, the Scottish government level rather than, rather than local government level. I mean, I think it's taken them a wee while to get going, frankly. Um, and there is now the kind of sprint going on within the Scottish government. Um, but it hasn't felt like an emergency 
respond so far. There has been some welcome additional money for for acquisitions and things like that. But and and I don't um, I don't wish to understate the financial pressure that the Scottish government was under. But I also think, and this is this goes beyond the, the housing budget itself. But I think it is particular to housing budget. Is I think in an emergency situation, we would expect to see significant prioritisation of, of funding for the area which is under in a kind of emergency state. And, and I don't think we've really seen that yet. But obviously, the, the Chancellor's budget last week appears to have given the Scottish Government additional capital funding. So I think the real litmus test from the Scottish Government's perspective will be that budget in a few weeks' time. And I think, I mean, I think the Scottish Government could certainly be be clearer and more ambitious, and that would help give a bit of a platform to, to local government. Because, you know, lo local government and RSLs are the main kind of delivery partners in this space. And, and ultimately, and I'll defer to two professors to my right on this, is ultimately we need a system which is, which is stable and predictable to, make, to allow people to plan and to get out of this, the, the kind of horrendous circumstances we're in just now, and get back onto a on, onto a camera platform that we can make the kind of generational changes that Ken was talking about. Yeah, uh, I, I would add to that. I completely agree. Completely agree about the point about the opportunity that the last week's budget provides for capital spending. Uh, the, the, I've been, you know been following what's been going on in local government to some extent, and I know you're obviously going to have a panel after us from, from local government, but it seems to me that certainly in Glasgow and Edinburgh there's been a phenomenal amount of work uh, for, for following the, de the, the, de the, de the declaration. I mean, you can see that in the Edinburgh Action Plan, which is a, you know, a very wide-ranging do do document which goes far beyond simply the you know, the, the, the direct homelessness measures that they're trying to tackle in a sense. There's, work and to be done in allocation policies and things of, the, mm -hmm. of that kind and, and sev several other, other things, as well as recognising it's a partnership with other people in, in Edinburgh. I know in Glasgow that there's been a huge amount of work done trying to improve their up-to-date, live, real-time monitoring and statistical analysis of what's going on around them as there's <coughs> a massive amount of change going on. So th there, is, there is a huge amount being done. Certainly, the other two authorities I know, I know best at this point, but I think I'm sure you will hear more and similar things from the other authorities uh, this, 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 this morning. Uh, they still, of course, have to del deliver. Uh, we haven't seen the detail of Glasgow's action plan yet, so uh, that, that, that remains to be seen. But Edinburgh is incredibly detailed, and uh, there's, there's, there's a major corporate kind of attack on the issues that, that, that they've raised. Mm -hmm. Christian, do you want to come in on anything? Sure. sure. Um, so let me first carry out what I'm going to say. It does not just apply to Scotland. It also applies to England. And in fact, it applies to many countries around the world. I think the issue is that the government, so this government and other governments, uh, focuses on the symptoms of the problem rather than the causes. So the symptoms being high rents, and then the discussion is about rent caps to try to control the rent growth, um, uh, high prices, then the solution is help to buy, so tackle it. So both are tackling the symptoms and uh, homelessness and the solution is to, to help people with, with subsidies. What this ignores is the fact uh, is, is, is that it doesn't address the underlying causes of the problem. And the underlying causes of the problem in the UK are arguably a dysfunctional planning system that um, cages to nimbyism and uh, creates uncertainties that uh, my colleagues have been uh, talking about. And that uh, discourages home building and there is also a lack, and, and these two things reinforce each other, there is a lack of fiscal incentives for local authorities to permit development in the first place. In, in, in the UK, essentially, local authorities have the cost of development, but they, have very, they reap very few of the benefits of it. And if I may, so my home country is Switzerland. And Switzerland is kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum. In Switzerland, there are local income taxes, 
where local municipalities have in fact very strong incentives to permit development at the outskirts of uh, the municipalities to uh, like large parcels of land to attract good taxpayers that create local tax revenues. I'm not saying that that should be a role model because in Switzerland this has led to uh, a sprawl problem but just to, to illustrate the power of fiscal incentives, and uh, both in England and in Scotland, as if I understand that correctly, these fiscal incentives are lacking, and as a consequence, um, like this reinforces the problem that the planning system doesn't uh, deliver enough housing. Okay, Emma, briefly. Um, yeah, just, just briefly, um, on that, a lot of these um, actions sound more long-term and less emergency response. Um, would we have to have both work streams going on at once, or is it legitimate to take an emergency short-term view and then move on to looking at planning, land, taxation issues? Yes, I mean, the issue, I think, is that we like like well politics is usually short term oriented but if there is a crisis um then yes everything is is short term oriented but uh, the issue is you're not going to fix this emergency if you don't also tackle and focus and take bold measures long term and 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 i think that's the key issue that uh, you know governments are elected for four years but these reforms frankly they may take more than four years to have the full benefits and this is the reason why, why politicians shy away from them um, but we're not going to solve this emergency long term and it gets worse in the long run if we don't take these bold steps that uh, fix the institutional issues Okay. If, I, if I could just add to that briefly. Uh, we've recently published a report for Joseph Rountree about the affordable housing supply programme. And uh, towards the end of it, we talk about some short run proposals and some longer term uh, proposals. And the short run ones are clearly the emergency immediate response. How, how do you make the best use of the pot of resources you've, you've got? Uh, what, what other ways can you attract resource in to, to help that? What, what can you do to facilitate uh, supply? Uh, in the medium term, we think that the actual system of allocating resources has to change in a number of ways. That the way that uh, local authorities receive money for their social housing investment programmes, etc. But in the long term, there are, there are these things that Christian's talking about, about land reform, about uh, a national house housing, land agency, things of that kind. But the point is, as he said, the, the long term uh, will never get addressed because of our short term, or short electoral cycles, etc. So we, we need to find ways to, to take a long term view and, and recognise that the long term starts today sort of thing, and that you need to start putting in place those, those me mechanisms that will be uh, essential over, over time. And when we're involved in some other work, uh, just sort of advertise this while I can, uh, for, for the Church of England earlier in the year before the UK election, about kind of about the, the, the development of the governance of long term housing policy, about how you get parties to work to, together uh, and, and think about, again, working towards a functional housing system so that all policies move in the same general uh, route. OK, thanks. Um, certainly something for us to reflect on. Uh, um, so I do want to come back to the, the kind of the vision for um, Scotland's housing and we've agreed that we're in a housing emergency so how will we know when we're out of that emergency what would it look like I'd go back to I'm going to go back and amplify a little bit what I said there earlier uh, in the in the church of england's report we we talk about uh, a functional housing s system where the kinds of homes that people live in uh, have a have a quality about them they're, they're affordable they're energy efficient they're of a standard they're accessible all of those kind of things that the housing market operates the way a, a, an equilibrating or balanced market would would work and of underlying that there's all these things that you need to do to meet that happen but at the same time the housing system as a whole has to be uh, complementary has to work in unison uh, 
you, you should look at outcomes like homelessness and, and is it doing the things that you want? Is it falling? Is it brief? Is it rare, etc.? Is it non-recurring? That house prices and rents shouldn't be accelerating or decelerating, but they should be in the long term stable with respect to price inflation. They should be neutral, as it were. Uh, and, and those sorts of things also suggest that housing shouldn't be should be kind of neutral with respect to society as well. It shouldn't be creating greater inequalities. It shouldn't be redistributing wealth in favour of one group in, in, in relative to the, to, to the future. And it should complement pensions, social care, social security, all, all of those things too. So the question is, you know, that's fine to... So I think implicit in your question is it's fine to say, say these things and we can probably sign up to them. It's kind of what's in housing to 2040 as well. Mm. But... Uh, we just have to think that each policy that you're going, to, you're going to introduce has to kind of pass a litmus test. Of does it contribute to these things? And if it has negative knock-on externalities or bad consequences, how would you take an account mm -hmm. of that? So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, thanks very much for that. I think that was a very helpful uh, list of things that we might see in the future. Uh, does anyone have anything to add to that, Chris? Maybe. I'm just yeah. going to quickly add, a, it comes back slightly to the questions that that Emma asked as well, is I think I, I think it is perfectly legitimate for local government in particular to be looking hard at the emergencies within their within their areas. But as Christine has said, if we can, you know, get temporary accommodation numbers down, get homelessness cases down, and don't do anything about the longer term issues, we'll all be sitting here again in a few years' time. And that that would be a horrible outcome for individuals and a big policy failing in a part of the Parliament. So I think part of the the measure of getting out of this emergency should also be the, the longer term runway to preventing us falling back into this situation. And, and I do think if, as I say, I do think it's legitimate for decision makers to concentrate on these immediate challenges just now. But I think within local government in particular, you're putting an enormous amount of pressure on a very small number of staff at the moment within housing teams, within planning teams, within homelessness teams. And I do think while the capital budget is clearly critical to allowing local government and ourselves to invest in new supply, local government having the staff to plan both for the immediate emergency and for the longer term mm. um, future is really important. And I, I'm not an expert in a planning system, but I think that applies within to the planning system yeah. as well. Yeah, we've certainly heard plenty about <clears throat> how we need so many more planners. I'm, I'm going to move on. Um, that was that was two questions and a supplementary for, from Emma, just to say, and we've got quite a few other questions to ask. And I'm going to bring in Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Karina. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to focus in a wee bit more on the responses to those authorities that have declared the emergency. But first, I wanted to ask your views on what, what makes for an emergency in 12 of the local authorities but doesn't make for an emergency in the other 20. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about why some authorities would declare that and, and many others don't. Is it, is it the homelessness figures reaching a trigger point? Is it the number of void stock in a particular authority? So our council colleagues are sitting behind you and will join us in the second panel and we'll get their views. But could I just ask what your views are? What do you think it is that constitutes the emergency for some but not others? Maybe Professor Gibb, would you like to open up with a response to that? Yeah, uh, I think it's different in different places. I think... Uh, uh, in some cases, there will be it will be partly a reaction to, to to the pressure that local government is coming under from from various stakeholders and and their constituents and and uh, and and the, the the sort of priority becomes as a as a political issue for different reasons that's going to land in different ways and will be less visible or or, or, or obvious in other places. So it, it's. Uh, it's not surprising in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and I think you know the the, the different reasons that it happened in somewhere like Aberdeen is is an instructive that there was a very specific set of of, of issues there which re represented a structural problem that was hard to uh, uh, address. So I, I, th I think to that extent it's it's different in different places. I, I don't think we should conclude that it's finished at twelve as well. And, uh, I suppose, uh, but. Bear in mind that, and we'll go back to something that Christian said, uh, 
up, we have tremendous spatial variation in Scotland, actually, and, and different uh, arrangements and housing systems work in different ways. And, and I guess local authorities will have different perspectives about their capacity to deal with the things that they see as most challenging. In a way, what the emergency does is it's a trigger to say, we don't think that this can be resolved without a much more comprehensive sort of plan, plan, plan of actions, either by simply by the council, but perhaps in partnership with other people like, like the Scottish government and other pu 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 public agencies. So, uh, you know, perhaps we shouldn't get too hung up by the, the definition of emergency, as Chris was saying. It's, it's, a, it's a trigger. Uh, it's, it's clear that there are significant problems, some of which are, are national uh, or even U U UK n n national and, and have to be, be dealt with, but they will impact in different places in different ways. Thanks for that. Any views from uh, Professor Hilber or, or Chris just about what makes an emergency in one authority that doesn't make an emergency in another? So, this was addressed to me. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, yeah. Well, as, as I think Ken uh, said as well, it's, it's local pressures from different stakeholders that, that they see and, that's, I'm, oops, and that, that, is, that is driving presumably their response. I'm not an expert on what has driven each local authority in Scotland to, to declare an emergency. Um, I just want to, if I may, I want to come back briefly that, you know, the response to these local issues and like, uh, so we have to be very careful um, with these short-term measures. I was asked before, long-term versus short-term, you know, so, so like, short-term measures can actually be counterproductive. So if you have uh, rent caps that are too rigid, that, and, and we can just look at evidence from around the world, that is counterproductive in the long run. And, and it, 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 um, it leads to less investment from um, uh, institutional investors into the rental market. It, it, it encourages landlords to um, take properties off the market, and that makes um, problems worse. So this, this is an important point I, I wanted to add. Like, like often these short-term solutions are not balanced and not thought through enough, and that can make the problem worse. Okay, thanks. Chris, any views on just an why an emergency here and not there? What, what's the reasons for that? Um, in your view? I, I, I think Ken summed it up well, to be okay. honest. It's just that, that, yes, there are very different drivers and different, even in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow, you know, Glasgow has, has probably suffered most at the hands of the Home Office in terms of decisions which have, which have pushed people into the homelessness system. So, yeah, I, I think it does also, though, point towards, and it has been welcome saying some of the new money that the Scottish Government put in acquisitions, where they've made agreements with COSLA to focus that money on the local authorities, which are particularly struggling. And I do think, and that's part of the work which, which Ken has done for us in the Affordable Housing Supply Programme, if we want to really drill down on, on issues of affordability and where they might drive emergencies in the future, we do need to be a a bit more um, subtle in how funding is, is spread across the country. Okay, thanks for that. In terms of um, how you think the local authorities are effectively trying to deal with the, the emergencies that they've declared, uh, Ken, you, you were telling us a, wee, a moment ago about Edinburgh's good work that they've been doing. They, they've had a significant number of void properties that they've been trying to manage over recent years, and that's been circulated at the committee in recent months too, and you described some of that work. Could you just amplify that a little bit more and perhaps share some views again about how you see the authorities responding and what perhaps they're doing new to address the emergency that they themselves have declared as well? Well, uh, again, mainly this is speaking about Edinburgh uh, because I've been, I've been uh, looking at that. Uh, it seems to me that what's interesting, first of all, is that Edinburgh had a very inclusive all-in approach to how they would develop an action plan. So they, they were very consultative. And a lot of the things that came out of that were not, were not in a sense, specifically about the immediate issues of temporary accommodation and, and, and homelessness and that kind of imbalance thing. They, but they were reflective of, well, well, for instance, they do a lot of, of long-term private rental leasing 
to, to help with temporary accommodation, but they recognise that when they do a systems analysis, that there's a danger in overcooking that. If you can go, if you if you go too far down that road, there's a danger that you're actually undermining the lower end of the private rented sector more broadly, and that would have perverse outcomes because that could lead to more people, you know, coming in the other end of the home, home, homelessness uh, system. They also, uh, as a result of that, they've spent. They've got quite a large effort being put into the quality of their housing stock and trying to improve that, trying to do it. So, it's, yes, it's about building a lot of new social and affordable homes, but it's actually also about asset management of the housing stock they've, that, 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 that they've got. Uh, the, 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 so, so I think they've done quite a lot there. The other thing that's really quite interesting about Edinburgh, I think, is that they're actually reflecting on the broader sense of whether their homelessness service works as a whole. And, and what they might need to do to, uh, you know, really really understand its fit with the housing system, and how they could they could allocate their resource for that, and the way they organise themselves as effectively as possible to meet the needs of both the long term homelessness challenges they face, but also the actually del del delivering the action plan too. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, is the is the void tally in Edinburgh and other authorities a, a major component of this story? And Edinburgh have been pretty good in their submission. Yeah. We can see how they're tackling that and getting yeah. those numbers down significantly. Does that make? Do you think that makes a good contribution to trying to address some of these issues that we hear about? I think voids, uh, ac ac acquisitions, and those sorts of things, and empty homes are all things that help. Uh, Voids are not necessarily going to solve the problem in a place like Edinburgh or Glasgow, but they clearly make, make a difference if you can relet more quickly, if uh, you can get utilities to help uh, those kind of processes of properties can be relet. That that all helps. But compared to the size of the the challenge and the ongoing nature of it, getting getting much better void management control and getting them relet letable clearly helps. But it has it makes a finite con contribution. In the same way that empty homes partnerships and great work that that they do can only make a finite con con contribution because of the scale. Now, it will be more important in certain places, but it's not, as a general rule, I don't think you could say well, yeah, avoid dealing with voids better helps. It's not going to actually completely t take take this pro this problem away. Okay. And on that wider issue of it, what what are the tools that uh, everyone's at disposal to try to help here? Is it, is it, is it to build? more new housing, is it to make better use of the stock that we have, whether that's voids and relets and so on, or acquisitions, just what, what's your sense of the flavour of these particular tools we should be deploying, I sense that you might say we should deploy all these tools, but which do you think are the most well, effective it's, it's, at it, trying to tackle the issue? We should certainly have more tools, as many as many tools as we can get in the, in the golf bag, to mix my metaphor, <laughs> uh, but in the sense that, that, that different things are needed in different places. Uh, so, you know, what one area we've not talked about yet is so, social investment. I, I, I'm doing some research in England about social investment, which is involved in this sort of follow-on programme after COVID, uh, where, where everybody was in, and then they had to be, you had to have a follow-on uh, solution for them. And social investment plays a small but important role in, uh, in, in working with charities and ho housing associations. And again, I know Edinburgh from the impact from the action plan suggests that they are they are looking at greater use of social investment as a way of providing pr 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 providing a financial additionality as it were to help help achieve a greater volume of social affordable and, temp and temporary accommodation so mm. so there's, there's there's a range of those sorts of things yeah i was i was going to maybe just turn to that there if, uh, ken because your your report talks about some of these key messages and some of the ideas that, that, that might be deployed to, to change things about for the better is that that social, is that social investment idea that you're, you're saying there another an extra new tool that could be deployed here yeah. and I just invite you to to expand a little bit more on that along yeah. with, with Chris yeah. of course so so yeah so people like uh, resonance better society capital people like that they they, they are they are accumulating funds or bringing funds together which earn, earn a rate of return that that is uh, acceptable to to investors but it's, it's for good as it were and uh, they have got increasingly interested in providing housing which helps the homeless uh, s system out as it were so, uh, so often it's a form of long-term leasing but it's it's working in directly with a, 
a housing association or a social housing provider. So to give what, what one, one example, uh, there's, a, there's some projects in the north of England where effectively the housing association chooses which properties to purchase. The social investor purchases them and then they, 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 they provide support to the accommodation for, say, up to 10, 10 years, and they make a decision at the end of 10 years if they're going to buy the property or whether they'll give it back into the pool, and they pay a, they pay a kind of a fee for being able to use the, the property to the, the uh, fund. And uh, that, that frees up some capital, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it, it seems seems to work. So you get good providers who are good at managing these types of homes, and you get a, a new source of capital for them. Uh, which seems to work, and it and it meets some some of the requirements that the investors have, both financial but also, kind of uh, in terms of their philanthropic side. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Ken. Chris. Any, any other messages in that area to to share some ideas with, with the committee about how you can make improvements and some new ideas that could be brought to the table? Um, so first of all, I think problem is largely outside of the control of local authorities. So it's it's more at the national or like. Scotland level or UK level where, where you needed to act. Um, so I, I don't really have any great news suggestions in addition to what Ken said on, on the local side, on, on the national side. I mean, there, there are various measures that one could uh, consider to, you know, that, that don't tr um, dramatically reform the system but um, would help. Uh, so part of the problem is that the planning system creates all these uncertainties and leads to long negotiations between developers and, and local authorities, and that, that kind of leads to less supply than we otherwise would have. So what we have proposed, for example, is a developer levy, levy on the, the final market price that, that the developer would pay that will replace what we call in England Section 106 agreements. I think there are, here there are... 75 section one, section 75 agreements um, that that will create more certainty uh, for the developers and would encourage them to build more I think that that would be one measure that that would help Okay, thank you. Uh, rather, Chris, could you throw a few ideas? And yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think uh, Ken's absolutely right, is that definitely things like acquisitions, voids, social investment in, in supported accommodation or temporary accommodation are, all need to be part of our, of our toolkit. But, you know, it, it's pretty wild that Edinburgh City Council are spending, you know, I don't know if it's, it's slightly more or about the same on temporary accommodation as they are on affordable housing supply. You know, that is a situation that needs to change extremely quickly. And I think that that, that points to that broader long term foundations that we need to build to stop the emergency. And, and I should also say that the, the housing system does not operate in isolation. We have people in our country today, I mean, poverty stats, we can, I can reel off easily, you know, a million people in poverty, a quarter of those children, is people live incredibly insecure lives. And obviously their, their housing condition uh, it, is, is a big part of that. But we do also need a broader system where people have a decent income, people can get mental health support and things. Again, you know, it, it's difficult to criticise local government in this space, because if you imagine being a homelessness officer, at the moment, with the pressures that people people are coming into the system, who are hungry, who are in poor mental health, who are in distress. As a homelessness officer, you're not a trained mental health officer, and all these kind of things. And I think that that is also the other huge tool we have in this case of creating better security, better well-being for our people, so that they operate within a healthier housing system as well, because at the moment we're driving such demand into these uh, crisis services within local government, within the third sector as well, that it, it's just not sustainable in the long term. OK. Thank you very much, all three of you, for responding to those questions. Convener. Uh, thanks, Willie. Uh, just before I bring in Fulton McGregor with a question, Emma Roddick mentioned the word land, but we haven't really talked about that, and I'm aware certainly going to visit Argyll and Butte, and the committee's going to be going there uh, in, a, in a few weeks' time, that the, there's a real challenge in Argyll and Butte just in terms of, if you've ever been to Oban, for example, it's a really difficult situation where the well, town centre is full of uh, guest houses, but there's really not much land to build, not much available land. And I became aware, I was at the Nordic Council recently, last week in Iceland, talking to folks from that part of the world, and someone was talking about how 
this, um, the city of Helsinki, I think it is, actually own land in Helsinki. So it means that they can bring forward housing more easily. We don't have that kind of setup, I don't think, in Scotland. So land is a kind of perennial challenge to building, bring, bringing forward housing. I mean, I'm aware that developers do kind of buy land and, and bring it forward for local development plans. But is that a, situ a part of the challenge around the long-term issues that you're talking about, planning, et cetera? the land issue Ken yes I mean yes it is and and so we we have uh, we've suggested as as a lot of the of housing practice I think so it suggests in Scotland that we we would benefit from a strategic land agency of some kind which which could work in partnership with uh, local authority you can't really imagine it not working in partnership with local authorities if it's going to work but it, it would have the capacity to help support SME builders, for instance, SME builders are, are often much more significant uh, in in rural areas, and as they as they decline and dwindle, it makes rural housing supply all the more challenging. So, mm -hmm. being able to use resource in a clever way to incentivise them and support them in the way that I think the UK government is, has has announced uh, in, in in the budget uh, for for England uh, that, that that there may be a there may be opportunities there. The other thing about the agency that I find potentially attractive, and it's a very good report by the Scottish Land Commission about the kind of role that such an agency might play, but one of the things that's really attractive about it is that it's, it needs to be pump-primed pump for its initial funding, but thereafter it should be able to, if it, if it follows the plan of creating sites that are ready for use, or helping with the, the master planning and development of bigger sites, then takes the, 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 the fee from doing that and then it recycles that fee into further for right. further investment for, for land. And that's one of the features of what you might call successful funding and investment systems in other parts of Europe. If you look at the likes of Finland and Austria and Denmark, Denmark in particular, they all operate long-term schemes where funds are built up and then they're recycled into further investment, both in the stock but also to support new new build as well. And and that's all part of the same thing, Sweat, sweating the equity you've got, recycling it, re, mm -hmm. re, reusing it, so that you're not dependent, as dependent on the whims of uh, government budget priority decision making on an annual basis, but you've right. actually got an internally coherent self-regulating, -re self-financing uh, system. Thanks for that. And it sounds like probably there's a role for the Scottish National Investment Bank in, in, yes. in that kind of situation. Um, I'm just again before I bring you in Fulton I just want to say to colleagues we're rapidly coming towards the end of our time and we've got so quite a few questions to cover but if you've been paying attention which I hope you all have been we have started to touch in on some of the areas that we're interested in exploring a little bit more so just have that awareness Fulton come on in Thanks, convener, and a good morning to the panel. Yes, yeah, it's definitely been a, a session that seems to have went in very quickly indeed. Um, I wanted to focus uh, my line of questioning on that interplay of the relationship, if you like, between the, the Scottish and the UK government. We've obviously got um, a new a new UK government in place now. Um, and one of the things that Scottish... consistently called the UK government to do is to abolish loans. I wonder if uh, the panel uh, agree with these, uh, agree that these reforms are needed uh, and can maybe elaborate on what they think that might be the, the impact Fulton, uh, um, on the housing emergency of such reforms. Fulton, um, you glitched yeah. out a little bit, so I'm going to need to just, if you can just paraphrase your question, that would be great. Okay. Sorry, yeah, uh, sorry, convener. There has been some connection issues here today. I'm not entirely sure what they are. Um, what I was asking was that the Scottish government have consistently called on the UK government to abolish the bedroom tax and permanently operate local housing allowance. Do the panel think that these reforms are needed, and what impact do they think they might have on the housing emergency? Okay, I think we got that. Great, Chris. Um, I mean, yes, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, the bedroom tax is long overdue. Um, the bin, frankly, and that would free up Scottish government resources for, for doing other things. And, and we've been very consistent as well as in our calls for, for local housing allowance to keep up with rents. Um, you know, that's a particular problem in, in the, the cities and in Scotland as well. So, yes. Okay, 
And very briefly, anybody else got anything new and different to add to that? Yeah, uh, well, I would say up uprating the LHA is essential. Uh, uh, and I, I, I wrote a report for the Parliament in 2015 about abolishing the bedroom tax. Uh, still, still waiting, and I completely yes, agree. right. It's been going on for almost 10 years now. Fulton, do you want to come back in? Yeah. Yes, Governor, and I'll, I'll roll my last two questions in into one um, for the interest of time. Um, I wonder if the panel thinks if there are any other short-term actions that the UK government could take to help address the housing emergency in Scotland. And I wonder also what the panel think about the forthcoming Scottish go uh, government's budget uh, in this area um, on the back of the UK government's budget last week. Chris. I'll come in quickly. I mean, I think LHA reform is is has to be at the top of of their their actions i think broader reform of the social security system that takes out some of the most egregious parts of it which um i know have been have been played for a long time but also just the basic rate of universal credit is so measly that it leaves people unable to afford essentials and i think that that's absolutely crucial i think the increase in the capital budget means there is an opportunity and I think I think the Scottish Government and the finance sector has been pretty clear that housing will be her <laughs> number one priority and I think we need to see that reflected and I think we need to see that reflected at scale. I would just add the point I made earlier though about local government having the resources available to deliver on additional capital funding if if that is forthcoming but I think that will be a, a crucial test of the Scottish Government's uh, response to this emergency. Thanks for that. Anything New and different to add? Yeah, just, just one, one thing. Uh, we have benefited in the last few years from financial transactions. Cap capital is mm -hmm. a flexible way of raising uh, debt f finance to, to do things, particularly in, in some very good examples of mid-market rent in Scotland. Uh, that's got all sorts of benefits attached to it. It was obviously massively cut uh, in, the, in the budget last year. Uh, that, that it would be great to return to a programme which includes that, which isn't to the detriment of the grant funding element for mm. social housing. OK, great. Thanks very much. Christian, do you have anything to add? Like My, my main points really are long-term solutions rather than short-term ones. So uh, just two very quick points, like uh, you know, replacing Section 106 or Section 75 with, with something um, that's that reduces these uncertainties would help. I, I think help to buy has been a policy that has not been actually helping young people uh, much to get on the owner-occupied housing ladder in places where supply is unresponsive. Actually, it has increased mainly house prices and if, if anything has made housing less unaffordable. So it has helped to, to build housing in, in some areas where supply is responsive, but their housing is not really housing shortage is not really a, a major problem. The, these places have different problems, and in places where housing shortages are a massive problem because housing supply is very unresponsive, in those places, help to buy has increased uh, um, prices rather rather than uh, leading to more construction. And so, I would replace this policy with something that is helping younger people. Um, to get more affordable housing rather than the current policy. Okay, thanks. Anything else, Fulton? Maybe he's frozen. I think he might have frozen. Okay, I'm going to bring in Alexander Stewart. You've got a number of questions. <coughs> Thank you, Camilla. We've, we've touched on this morning the, the effects of the medium and long term and the issues that are required. Uh, and you've also touched on how, what the housing system should look like uh, to try and prevent homelessness and having these uh, housing emergencies in some of the discussion you've had this morning. But it would be quite useful to get a flavour of how effective you think local authorities and the Scottish Government uh, current actions are in working to achieve a housing system that is fit for the long term. Uh, and if there are any good uh, highlighting areas of good practice that already are in place that you think is moving towards that goal of trying to achieve uh, something that's more uh, sustainable uh, and the foundations that they're putting in that will help uh, manage the, the crisis as, uh, as we go forward, that would be useful. Or are there areas uh, that need uh, to begin to see work 
and more progress being put into work in local authorities and in the Scottish Government to ensure that we have that long-term change. Chris first. Yeah, sure, thanks. I mean, I think like the Affordable Housing Supply Programme in and of itself mm. is, is a good programme. It's got the right idea behind it. It's when we first started this project, part of um, the, the Ken is, is talked about. Part of my drive on that was that the Scottish Government were investing a lot of money in that. And from my perspective, it was important that that money was going as far as possible in, in, in reducing poverty. So part of the report that Ken has done is to look in, in a lot more detail at are there ways in which we could use that spend and that programme more effectively to target those areas which have the, the highest affordability problems. And, and I think that Obviously, the recent cuts to the, the capital budget have slight, well, slightly significantly undermined that, along with COVID, etc. So I, I think you know, we don't have the worst platform to build from in Scotland, but I, I do think it's, it's about scale, it is about that long-term thing, and it is about Scottish Government, local government and RSLs having quite a difficult conversation mm -hmm. about where do they focus their efforts to take on the, the areas of the country which face those biggest pressures, and if we can, if we can put those, kind of right those areas, then we'll be in a far better position to have that longer-term stable market that I think we all want. Professor again. Yeah, so, I, so Housing to 2040 seems to be, it has a lot of really attractive kind of aspects to it. It is comprehensive, it's wide, wide-ranging, it, it kind of gets that kind of all-system kind of reality of the housing system, but uh, it's never been as strong on the delivery and the kind of ongoing transparent mm -hmm. monitoring of how effective it's being and how whether bits and pieces of it actually are consistent with each other in, 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 in a sense. So I, I would go back to this kind of idea we had with the Church of England work, which was basically to say it's not about these short-term strategies for a new government mm -hmm. particularly, it's about thinking about a 20-year or a 30-year programme which tries to take the housing system from one trajectory to a different one. And that in order to do that, you need to agree on the aims, the, the, what Housing 2040 has done well. And I think most people did sign, sign up to it. But then have a kind of independent accountability mechanism to try to hold people's feet to the fire if, if their new housing policies don't fit with that goal and how do they justify it. So it's a bit like how the Climate Change Committee yeah. is supposed to work in, in Westminster. West, West there's no, in a sense, there's no escape from the conundrum of how do you get you know, a succession of parliaments with different people in power mm. and with different priorities and different contexts. How do you get them to stick to a long-term plan? We need to find a way to do that. It's a governance question, fundamentally. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, it's going to be really hard to achieve the kind of long-term things that Christian's talking about. And Christian, do you want to add anything to it? Yeah, so I think the aims of this strategy are, are laudable. Um, mm -hmm. like, but I don't see the policies you know, in there. That So ma many of these policies we discussed are frankly, uh, you say, uh, you know, a drop of water on a hot stone. Like, so we talked about voids. So I, I looked at the numbers. We talk about 9,000 units that are empty. Yes, that if we can reduce that number, that would be helpful. But, and this is 1.4% of the total social housing stock. So the vac a vacancy rate of 1.4% is actually quite low. Yeah. Actually, that's, that that's shows problem. another problem that we are facing is that there is such a long waiting list. That's why this, this uh, vacancy rate is, is so low. Like a natural vacancy rate equivalent mm -hmm. to a natural unemployment rate <laughs> tends to be higher because people need time to, to uh, you know, search and match in this market. So many of these issues or investments Yes, they are helpful, but they are a drop on a hot stone. Yeah. Um, I think what, what's really needed is there are some discussions going on at Westminster reforms of the planning system. I think that will be helpful. And the other point I would like to stress is markets, housing markets are interconnected. Mm. I, I see a lot of discussion in this country on or focus purely on social housing and affordable housing. But if you just 
create affordable housing and you, you ignore the rest of the housing market, you're never going to solve the problem, except if you have 100% social housing. So what I would like to stress is if you get the, you know, the development sector going again and you, you, you develop more housing in the right places, which is one of the aims of the strategy, if it's private market housing, that will reduce private rents, that will reduce some of the pressures on the social rental market. And so I, I, I would urge uh, the committee and, and, and policy makers to not just focus on the social housing market, but actually helping the private uh, sector, mostly the private rental sector, but also the owner-occupied sector, because these things are all interconnected, get that construction going, get more supply on the market in places where we need it. That will help the lowest incomes and those most in need, even though that housing is not directly provided for them. And I mean, you, you've, you've touched on that, the idea of about the cooperation between, between private, uh, between social and between rented. Uh, and we need to get the balance uh, right across the sectors to try and ensure that we are not top heavy on one side or not bottom heavy on the other, uh, so that there's a, an equilibrium across, and that would help. Uh, so if we are looking at the, the different roles uh, of, of social and private rented sectors in providing affordable housing, uh, what more specifically uh, and what differences do, the, do you see Scotland having? Because you've touched on what's happening in other parts of the country, mm. but also what's happening in other countries across the world yeah. as to how they manage that. Yeah. Uh, and, and Scotland has attempted to try and cover and go some distance to some in the Scandinavian side and others. But there still needs to be this imbalance uh, between the, the rented and the social uh, and how we, how we try and fix that for the future. Mm -hmm. But it would be good to get a flavour from you if you do think there are different things that Scotland should be doing itself uh, in trying to manage that. Uh, because it's, it's quite apparent from what Professor Gibbers said that in, down south there seem to be managing some of that better in some areas uh, as to how it's, how it's progressed. So it would be good to get a flavour from you as to what you think we should be doing here in Scotland to try and identify that. Mm. So, so first of all, you know, like you mentioned international, the international context. Uh, let, me, let me talk a little bit about my home country, Switzerland. It um, has a very different system, has essentially has no homelessness mm. and doesn't have any social housing. It has a, a very, uh, it has rent control, but it has a, a mild form of rent control. Um, there are other countries like Germany or Austria that don't have this homelessness problem. And I, I understand the focus on affordable housing and social housing because this is where the, you know, the main issues lay. But that doesn't necessarily mean by building more social housing you're going to solve that problem. Um, th that's the message I want to convey. And uh, you know, I come back to my point. Um, unfortunately, the only fixes that help um, these lower income households and younger people in the long, in, 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 in the long run is if we tackle these, these problems. And I, I understand the tax system is uh, the prerogative of the Scottish Government, so you could consider reforming the council tax and, you know, what we propose is an annual uh, proportional property tax um, where local authorities keep the revenue from from their from their um, or even a land value tax that 's kind of the economist 's ideal um, that um, that would help because it will create these fiscal incentives to local authorities to permit development in the first place and I also understand that the Scottish government it is in the power of the Scottish government to reform the planning system and to um, like you know, these, all these countries that I mentioned, they have a zoning system where um, that, that's rule-based. Yeah. If you fulfill the rules, you can build in, in certain parcels. And, and the British system is discretionary. Um, every change of land use needs uh, permission. And that, that creates all these problems. And so I would, I would propose to, you know, consider planning reform to reduce these uncertainties and create more incentives to, to develop. Thank you. Uh, Professor Gibber, Chris, do you get anything you want to add? I think the only thing I, I would say is uh, I think we need to be 
careful about how we approach the private rented sector uh, in the sense that uh, we, we not only do we have uh, you know requirements to improve the non-price regulatory standard mm -hmm. of, the, of the rental market and I think often that's kind of non-controversial really a lot of it's very sensible we did some work for the, the then department levelling up last year uh, about the impacts of non, on non-price reg regulation on investment decisions and found, found it was ne ne negligible in the evidence, the international e evidence, which was slightly surprising from a, an economist's point of view, but, but the evidence wasn't, just wasn't there. Uh, I think the, the issues that are different are the, f the fiscal incentives and, the, uh, and, and, and obviously the level of rent control and how it impacts on dis decision making. I, I think it's quite, I, I can see a world where Christian's uh, milder rent controls can work in a certain market context okay. if it's designed in certain ways. There's absolutely no reason why something could be designed in a way consistent with, with what we need in the, in the market, which isn't too, too distorting. But the point is broader, is, is that we've gone quite a long way to make it much less mm. worthwhile to be a pri private landlord for some of the tax changes that we've, we've, we've had, both LBTT as well as tax relief and things of, of that kind. And what you're getting is an even bigger imbalance in demand and supply. Yeah. And all that will do is push rents up. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can't be the goal. We, we, we obviously we need a private rental sector to perform certain functions. Mm -hmm. It's probably better if more of that is mid-market or higher in the market. So, but uh, you know, we're not creating a, a, an environment where that flexibility can happen. Mm -hmm. And the final thing to say is that we don't have anything like the rental market that Switzerland has in terms of size, but it is more than twice the size it was. It mm. plays a big role in the housing system, and just to treat it as a as a bad thing that's, that's not, ir ir irredeemable is just not very sensible. Mm -hmm. It seems to be about making the wider system work. Thank you, Chris. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, the, the private rental sector definitely has a place in, in the housing market in Scotland. It, it, at the moment, it's that there are too many people and fragile incomes who are having to having to rely on it. And because of the the, un, the, the imbalance within the broader market, that, that's why rents continue to rise. And, and that I don't think that's an outcome that anybody no. particularly wants. So, I mean, I do think, I mean, Christine has hit on quite a fundamental point. I do think the way in which we tax property and wealth in the country, we have got our heads in the sand. We, you know, council tax is, is entirely regressive, punishes low-income families, and frankly, pretty much every political party in this parliament is stepping away from it and saying it's too hard. We, it's not too hard. We have to change it. Much wealth in Scotland is tied up in our housing market. It's part of the unhealthiness of it just now. The concentrations of, I have to keep my development trust hat firmly out of the way here, but you know, concentration of, of second homes and things is, is damaging people's lives in Scotland. It's something we have to change. The council tax system is, needs to go in the bin with a bedroom tax. Thank you. Time's tight, convener. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alexander. Uh, just uh, before I bring in Emma Roddick with a question, um, I just wanted to pick up on, uh, Christian, you were, well, so in kind of terms of longer term issue, and this is not necessarily a question for you, Christian, but you mentioned the need for reforming our planning systems. But something that I began talking to our Garland Butte Council around this, um, a point was made where planning permission might be granted to a developer, but then they, we don't have any in the system that requires a developer to move forward so they've got the permission but they don't necessarily move forward with actually building the houses and you know is there something that we need in place that could help them actually you know, you've got the permission now move forward and do that Ken I'm going to pick on you okay well I mean one thing that the the people who who kind of promulgated the proportional property tax for fair or share to talk about is to uh essentially apply a council tax, well, sorry, proportional property tax to the land which has, has planning permission so that, you know, it's a straightforward kind of fiscal incentive to try and uh, br bring the land through, through, through the development process. Mm -hmm. uh, so those kinds of fiscal incentives kind of make sense. They're probably going to have bigger impacts where housing markets are tighter as, as well. So that's, that may actually be of, of value to mm -hmm. the, what happens to house prices and land, land prices. Okay. Thanks. Anybody, anything else? Christian? If I may add, um, so like the current planning system creates uncertainties. And what this does is, in economic terms, it creates a real option value to wait. It 
actually it's the system itself that sometimes make it, makes it attractive for developers to wait development because the developer may wait for the future to get a higher return. Mm -hmm. uh, this system, uh, this problem doesn't really exist in many other countries that have a rule-based zoning system because there there is no option value. So they, um, uh, you know, you, you don't see this, this hoarding of land with planning permission, uh, in part because there is much land where in principle you have planning permission. So this is not, the real option is not that valuable. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Emma Roddick. Thanks, Convener. Can I pick up, Chris, on your comments about the private sector? Um, I wondered, um, in an ideal situation, uh, how big should the, the private sector be and what role should it play? Um, like, I, I couldn't pluck a number from my head in terms of the overall balance. I mean, in terms of a role it should play, it can provide flexibility for people. It can, you know, but not everybody wants to move to a particular area for a, a long period of time. Um, all of those kind of things. I think it's the, the private sector private rented sector is a, is a natural part of any of any housing market as I've talked about I think we do need a larger social sector in Scotland I think that begin, brings security and and all of these things to people's lives and a platform from which to build on but we we have seen a significant shift away from that since the turn of millennium which is, is part of how how this could be this emergency could be predicted so um, yeah, it needs. I think the Scottish government have done a lot to regulate it better in in recent years. How we look at quality over time, it's um, decarbonising heating, etc. Energy efficiency is clearly important too. Um, but yeah, we feel really far away from a healthy balance of it just now. Yeah, I mean, I mean I've, I've got a friend, uh, Tony O'Sullivan, I used to work with, and he always made the point that uh, the private rental sector doesn't need to be as big as you might think it does relative to say on our occupation of social renting because it turns over more quickly or it should turn over more quickly because most people a lot of people in the rental market don't want to stay in it for, forever some people do and that's that's obviously fine but so you, you you've got a more it's a more dynamic sector inherently there's more more things going on more people coming and going all the time even if it's a well reg regulated sector because it's labor market driven or, or whatever or it's students uh, so that's one thing to bear in mind. It does. It, it just, there's no. I mean, I also don't think there's any right num answer to, to your question. Actually, I think it, it's so context specific and depends on the how you perceive the system as a whole and whether it's in balance or, or, or not. The other thing to say is that the private rented sector, there may be there may be an inherent latent demand for it which is not being met. At the other end of the system, where Obviously, a lot of people can't get into an occupation because house prices, relative incomes are so high, and because the mortgage market is much more re regulated than, than it was. And that is a situation which has just got more and more extreme o o over time. So there's, there's certainly a case for, I think, wanting to shift some of the people who are in the private rent sector into, into more secure, so social and affordable housing. But there's also a case for ensuring that the rental market remains capable of, of providing the quality and attraction of long-term housing for people who otherwise, in earlier times, would have become a, a home owner too. Okay. Thanks very much for that. And I'm going to bring in uh, Megan Gallagher, who's joining us online. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, my question relates to rural areas because we know that they are in danger of being left behind when looking at Scotland's housing emergency. Uh, with many jobs, of course, in rural Scotland tend to be lower paid, wages in general not keeping in pace with inflation, and they also have less localised infrastructure, less access to public services, and that makes it less likely for young people to stay, often moving to other parts of the country. So my question is, how do we tackle depopulation and could this be the answer to uh, tackling Scotland's housing emergency within our rural areas as well? Thanks very much. Chris? Um, yeah, my development trust hat is screaming to jump onto my head now. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean as, as you've said, Megan, I mean, the, the housing emergency and housing inaffordability, unavailability within a rural area 
is so it, it's such a perfect encapsulation of how the housing system uh, interacts with the economy as well. You see so many local businesses struggling to be open all week because they can't they can't get staff within the area because people can't afford to stay within the area due to affordability. So I think, you know, it is crucial in, in parts of Scotland when there are high concentrations of, of second homes and, and short-term lets, etc. It's really important that councils manage that appropriately. And I think there are also different um, ownership models, how land operates within these areas, like things like the Scottish Land Fund allowing communities to to own land, I think, I think is really crucial because it, these are, as as you know, that rural areas. You these decisions need to be made very close to the the communities affected because those communities know each other. They know how businesses operate. They know how public services operate. They know where the childcare centres are. They know where social care is available. All of these different things that unlock economic activity. So how. It, surely has to be part of the solution to really empower local communities and local government to be able to make really good decisions for their local communities. Thank you. Anybody else? Christian? Yeah, so, I mean, the fact that housing in rural areas is unaffordable is in itself astonishing. I mean, this is, I think, a, a Scottish issue. Um, in most other countries, housing is very affordable in rural areas, but in part because there is no scarcity uh, of land um, in, in those places. So this suggests to me two things, or one of two things, or both things. Um, it su suggests to me that the true underlying problem is economic problems in those areas, and we, we should probably focus on those areas uh, first and foremost. I'm not an expert enough to, to advise on what the policies there should be uh, for Scotland. And the second thing is, if housing is, is expensive in those rural areas, it must be driven by a planning system that creates artificial scarcity, because in other countries, frankly, housing is very cheap in rural areas. And it's like in England, it's a similar issue that in some areas, housing is very expensive. And so either... So what one issue could be, of course, uh, if, if, it, if, um, if it's touristy areas and, and there we have a second home problem, that, that is, th those places are actually attractive for, for um, second home investors. That, that's a different issue. But if it's a, non, if it's a rural area that is not very touristy and, and, it has a, and it has high house prices, it must be planning system driven. Okay. Chris. On that quite. I mean, I think one of the issues as well is is SME builders available within rural areas as well as like, you know, again, I, I will firmly put my development trust hat on now. But there are areas, say, where where we are, where there is planning permission for housing, there is land which is which is there ready, but the the mix between the cost to to construction companies and developers to actually Put, put spades in the ground is, is preventing those from happening just now. So again, looking at sites which are already kind of there and ready to go and how we unlock those is, is really crucial. Mm. Yeah. Ken. I was just going to add, uh, I think it's important to recognise that rural areas are heterogeneous. You know, they're not all the same. The issues are different. And uh, when local authorities, as the strategic bodies, are developing st strategies to, to, to develop housing and communities and sustained co communities, they need to have a really robust evidence base uh, about what's, what's going on. And I'm just rem 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 reminded of conversations we've been having with uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and, and, and other uh, par partners about how, how, how does housing fit into trying to develop marine and renewables investment in the west coast of Scotland, for, for instance. And they need to have a much more robust kind of needs assessment and, and demand assessment, yeah. market assessment, in, in order to think about how the, the volume of housing which would be needed to, 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 to basically allow people to affordably live in places as part of uh, communities, extending existing communities or, or whatever, that that really needs a significant amount of, of good, good evidence to, to base that on. Yeah. Great. Th thanks very much for that. And, and I, I will say that we did have a very useful session in the spring of 2024 focusing on rural uh, rural housing. So that, that's, that's there for folks watching online to refer to. Um, 
But I think also the point, Chris, that you made about the SME builders, that came out in that session that in, I think it was uh, after the um, financial crash of 2008, the bottom fell out of SME um, construction companies that, are, that were responsible for building a lot of the rural housing. So there was something earlier, I can't remember exactly the words of it, but something earlier was said, I think maybe the land supply bit that you were talking about, Ken, that could incentivize uh, SMEs to come forward and, and get established there. Um, but there's also some other issues talking that have been discussed around building at scale. So thinking about scale, but two houses in all, you know, dotted around, say, the northwest coast of, of uh, um, Sutherland, where the, there's a kind of collective action to buy all the materials, uh, and that keeps th those costs down. So, yeah, some good solutions there, but you definitely need to kind of persist with it. That actually brings us to the end of our questions. Oh, I, well, except for one that I'm being reminded of. Um, and, um, yeah, so the, so the Scottish Government's got a new national outcome uh, proposal, which is one for housing. So in the performance framework, there hasn't been one on housing. And that... that um, outcome, they say, is that we live in safe, high quality and affordable homes that meet our needs. And I'd be interested briefly just to hear what you think of the proposed new outcome. And could that help the Scottish Government guide its policies to address the housing emergency? Any thoughts on that? Chris? This is maybe to end not on the most exciting note, but... Um, we need better data within our housing. We need to understand the needs and demands of housing across the country um, in more detail at a national level so that we can help make be better policy to allow local decision makers to, mm. to make decisions which could enable that outcome. We have a lot of national outcomes in Scotland. That, that I mean, it's, the wording is, is fine. I mean, it's, yeah. it's nice. It's something we would all support. But we've got to do it. We've got housing to 2040. The visions and principles of that are really... They're good. Mm. They are. They are a much better housing market than we have today. But we need to do it. The, the words don't fix it. Okay. Great. Anybody else thoughts on that? Don't have to. <laughs> Only to say that uh, when we've been having uh, our discussions about the, the right to adequate housing and its role in a whole set of housing policies and questions, like like the meaning of affordability. Uh, a key point is the kind of idea of the progressive re realisation that, that I don't think uh, a statement like that needs to needs to reflect in the fact that we aren't anywhere there mm. at the moment for a, a large num number of people, and uh, we need to we need to have a way of getting from A to A to, a to B, and, and and do that in a consistent way. Okay, thanks, Christian. Yes. The aim is, is right, the vision of 2040 is right. The visions of 2040 are all, this is all good, but it's wishful thinking unless we tackle the fundamental problems and the fundamental issues that, that the housing market and the land markets are facing in this country. And unless, unless we, we tackle these long-term issues, I'm afraid um, it is wishful thinking. We're not going to get there. We're not going to get there for for all all people or most people. Okay, thanks. And it certainly, we, uh, over the course of this discussion this morning, we've certainly covered some of those issues that need to be tackled. So, re very much appreciate you coming in this morning and contributing to our our work on the um, housing emergency. I'm now going to briefly suspend the meeting to allow for a change of our witnesses. Thank you.
And we're joined on our second panel this morning by Donna Bogdanovich, who's the Head of Housing Strategy and Development at the Borders, Scottish Borders Council, Stephen Llewellyn, who is the Chief Housing Officer at North Lanarkshire Council, Derek McGowan, who's the Service Director for Housing and Homelessness at the City of Edinburgh, Blair Miller, who's the Head of Housing and Communities at East Ayrshire Council, and Edward Thomas, who's the Head of Housing and Property Services at Murray Council. And we will try to direct our questions to specific witnesses where possible. But if you would like to come in on the back of something, please indicate that to myself or the clerks. We've got about, uh, we've got until 11.30 for this session. Um, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. So I'd be grateful if we can keep our um, responses succinct and also colleagues, if we can keep our, our questions succinct. And there's no need to turn on your microphones as we'll do that for you. Um, so I have got some opening kind of general questions, and my first one is going to go to Edinburgh City Council and uh, Scottish Borders, so that to, to Derek and Donna. And having said, keep it brief, my questions are quite extensive, but see if I can roll them together um, as I go along. And then just so you know, um, folks, my, my second batch of questions will come to Murray, East Ayrshire and North Lanarkshire, so, so you'll know that we will get brought in. Um, so the committee's previously heard about challenges in the housing system, and we'd be interested to hear what specific factors have caused you to declare a housing emergency. Uh, and what do you hope to achieve from declaring such a, declar a declaration? So maybe I can start with Derek and then go to Donna. Uh, thank you, and thanks uh, for the invitation to speak to the committee today. Um, our emergency was based on homelessness fundamentally, so the number of homeless households we had, the number of, um, of children, young people that are in um, emergency accommodation, uh, temporary accommodation rather, um, and the rates of them, um, the, the difficulty in um, shifting that number, bringing it down, um, and that the factors that feed in there are probably numerous, certainly housing supply, um, availability of new housing, availability of affordable housing. Um, city factors such as um, average rent. So average rents in Edinburgh, say for a three bedroom, are about £400 more a month than they are uh, in the rest of the country. The average house price in Edinburgh, I think, is 93% above the national average. So contextual factors there in the local economy. Um, and a realisation that without a concerted effort and a focused effort that an emergency declaration would bring, um, it's going to be difficult to challenge them. Um, the, some of the issues around the affordable supply programme, including the, the, the funding, the level of funding that's uh, provided to us as a TMDF authority along with Glasgow to disperse that funding to RSLs. Um, the, the, the last calculation, I think, showed that um, in order to build the number of houses, affordable houses we needed in the city, um, was I think 693 million more than we have available. Um, that's the stark reality of it. So some of these factors um, were instrumental in that declaration. That declaration was agreed unanimously by uh, our council last November. Um, yeah, I mean, it's very similar for us to, to many of the local authorities. What drove our declaration was the similar issues around seeing increased homelessness presentations. Um, we're a small, you know, stock transfer rural, rural authority, so we're really struggling with the capacity to manage the increased caseload from those presentations and all those, also the staffing resources to manage the increased numbers of temporary accommodation. So our temporary accommodation is, you know, like everyone else, at an all-time high for us. Um, affordability is a huge issue. We have seen property values increased significantly over the last few years, including private rents as well. But also construction costs have just gone through the roof over the last few years, and that's really prohibitive um, in our region. There's an element of market failure, so we don't have a lot of developer interest. So while you know, we're still developing new affordable homes, we're not really getting that many market homes built at the moment. Um, you'd mentioned earlier on about kind of pre-recession and we were building or or the market was delivering between six and eight hundred homes a year and now it's around two or three hundred so those are the kind of issues that, that um, prompted our declaration okay thanks very much for that um i'm interested in 
Um, getting a, an overview from both of you on your high-level plans to respond to the housing emergency. Donna, do you want to go first? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so what, we, what we've done is we've developed a draft housing emergency action plan and we've set up a programme board. Um, we've also secured increased lets to homelessness with our housing associations. Um, we are putting a lot of investment into empty homes and we're looking at short-term lets um, as well at the moment. Okay, thanks. And Derek? Mm. Thanks. Um, our action plan was developed in partnership with key uh, city partners. Um, I think that's the important point to make here. This is a city issue, it's not just a council issue. And, mm. and the support that we receive from, from partners um, and the support we're able to provide to them is really important. Our action plan is six key areas, sim simplifying access to housing, providing quality housing, data and partnerships, customer experience, providing specialised support um, and finance and funding. So six key areas, um, important actions in there, reviewing our allocations policy is important, understanding the data we have around equality, diversity and inclusion and the barriers to housing for um, people with protected characteristics, um, those in poverty. Um, and I think that's a key thing I should mention as well, as our plan is very much about poverty um, and how that fits in. Um, and, and wraps around the, the homelessness issues that we have. Um, homelessness, the level of allocations like Donna, um, we've been successfully working with our um, RSL partners to increase the, the percentage of lets to homeless, which has been really positive. Mapping the homelessness system out to understand where there might be any duplication, how we can avoid that and improve the use of resources. Um, Office or tenant relationships. Um, and a really important, um, and it was touched on in the earlier session, um, a real drive to improve the data and analysis we have, so getting better data, using it more effectively to plan what we do. Uh, and that's an area we're working quite well at the moment with um, the Scottish Government colleagues, Sean Neil and his team, around taking that forward and working with the Edinburgh Futures Institute as well. So uh, a myriad of different points there, and there's, about, I think, um, about 90 or so actions in our plan under those key headings. OK, thanks very much for that. So. Um, Derek, you kind of pointed out that you're working really well um, to improve the data, working with the Scottish Government to do that. I'd be interested to get a sense from both of you again uh, on the progress that you've made. So you've got the plans, um, data is going well in Edinburgh. Um, what other progress have you made in tackling the emergency? And how will you, you know, at what point will you be able to say that the housing emergency in your area is over? Um, yeah, thank you. Again, um, probably the highest profile thing we've been doing so far, um, lots of these actions are in place is, is void properties. That came up earlier as well. So we've managed over the last year or so to bring 500, just over 500 of our void properties back into use. So really positive. Uh, positive for people who are getting those homes. Um, also positive for rental income that can then be reinvested in the quality of the stock that we have. and capital borrowing, etc. So really important work there. Homelessness allocations, again, increasing that rate, um, or increasing our own rate of allocation to homeless, but working with RSLs as well. I mean, really positive um, working relationships there. So I would say they are the, the highest level things. Some of the work we're doing around the quality, diversity and inclusion, for example, um, is to set up a working group. Um, but that's been that's met once. So to understand because some of the, the, the key feedback we got in the consultation period was around people in the city who, um, the example we always use is people for whom English isn't their first language, um, won't even bother approaching the council and mm -hmm. to present as homeless because they don't see it as a system that, that works for them or that they can get into. So, so mm -hmm. trying to change that. Um, um, yeah, being succinct, I think the, the second part of the question around when is the emergency over? Um, I think we're asking. So I think there's two ways to look at that. One is where supply is sufficient, supply of affordable housing, but, but private housing as well. This isn't all about affordable housing. This is about demographic change and how the, the nature of the city will change over the next 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, so sufficient housing. Um, my own view is we have 5,200 homeless households in the city. Um, if we were to bring all our voids back in, that would only bring a thousand, one and a half thousand homes back into use. There's still three and a half thousand ish there. So um, we are well into four figures on homelessness, I think, when homelessness is in three figures. 
um, i.e. below 1,000. I think that's when we'll be saying we're really making a difference here. Um, and that is absolutely about poverty. It's about the hardship people face, the accessibility of housing, how we do that. Um, so I think that's all I would say on that. OK, thanks. Donna. OK, I mean, uh, our draft emergency action plan, it does have about you know 40 actions in it covered under two themes. So housing, home, homelessness and housing access, and then we've got supply. So that is the big thing that we are really trying to focus on in our region at the moment, and that is why we are investing significant, significant amounts of money into bringing private sector empty homes back into use. Um, I think, you know, it, it does remain challenging in, in our region, but we do have a very significant piece of work where we're collaborating, collaborating with the South of Scotland Enterprise Regional Economic Partnership and our colleagues over in Dumfries and Galloway Council. Um, it, you know, we started, you know, for many, many years, we've been acknowledging that there are issues that are really quite unique to our region. So in February last year, the Convention of South of Scotland held a housing summit, and that was um, convened by the Deputy First Minister at the time. And there were some really good discussions with developers, with the construction sector. So what we've really focused on over the last 18 months is, is building on all of that insight that we have gained and really looking to work with the sector to see what we can do to unlock some of the sites across our region. Land is not a huge issue. We do have a lot of land. It's actually getting um, the spades in the ground and getting it developed. Um, there's a lot of different logistical challenges, I think, which just need to be acknowledged. We operate in a very different financial environment. So in the summer, we did launch our regional housing action plan, which was led by the Regional Economic Partnership. Um, there's 10 actions in there that we're trying to deliver over the next two years, and it's very much focused on, on supply and engaging with that market. So that's a significant piece of work that we are doing as well. And, and just in terms of um, knowing when the housing emergency over, is that, that there's a sufficient supply for you? Well, we would, like, we would like to see an increase in market completions, I suppose. That would be one of the measures that we would use. And then I think, like everybody else, it's just seeing a reduction in homelessness presentations, moving to rapid rehousing as quickly as possible, seeing a reduction in our stock of temporary accommodation. So there's all sorts of data that we can, that we can measure against. But, um, yeah, but, but more supply is... is the sort of key thing for us, I think. Okay. And and you mentioned earlier um, that Scottish Borders Council is a stock transfer council. Um, are there any um, more, is there any more detail in, in, that you could give us around particular challenges in responding to the emergency in that case? Um, no, I'm, I'm not sure that our sort of stock transfer status um, presents significantly additional challenges. We're very lucky we've got... Um, some very exceptional housing associations that operate in our region. Um, I suppose, you know, an additional challenge for us might be that um, we have kind of limited control of our allocations because we do rely on the RSL allocation policies. Um, at times, we might struggle to get enough lets to homeless households, but, you, you know, our housing associations, again, are performing well there. Our target's 50%, and we are very close to that target. Um, and we're not really sure we would want to go beyond that because there's got to be a proportionate balance between the kind of housing waiting list, homeless transfers as well. Um, so, and I, we do obviously rely on the RSLs to spend our affordable housing supply programme allocation as well, and they've got a very strong track record of doing that and, and delivering new housing. So the outcomes are probably very similar whether you're stock transfer or, or not really at the end of the day. Um, but it is, there's obviously that element, there's a lack of control in some areas. Okay, thanks very much for that. And briefly, Emma Roddick, you want to come in with a supplementary here? Yes, thank you. Um, specifically to, to Derek, um, I know that there were already moves within the council um, to address some of the housing pressures prior to the emergency being declared. Has that declaration helped with the urgency, um, both from politicians and the, the officer side? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. The real focus um, crystallises a lot of the actions we needed to take um, and, I guess, supplemented them with longer-term actions. So definitely, definitely a bonus, yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, 
Murray, Murray East Ayrshire and North Lanarkshire Councils Europe. Um, and uh, so initially I'd like to get a sense of what your understanding is uh, by a housing emergency and if there's been any consideration in whether uh, that uh, housing emergency applies in your lo local authority area. Um, so let's just start with that because I've got a couple of other questions. So maybe Edward, we can start with you. Yeah, thank you. So we do have sustained demand for our homelessness services, but you know we believe that we're kind of coping at this stage. So we're monitoring uh, the both approaches for homelessness. They went up modestly last year, and our availability of temporary accommodation as well as our throughput. So we're managing to still keep homeless journeys under six months, which you know is quite. I think uh, good, you know, in terms of the national comparator. But we're not um, complacent. Um, you know, we, we are certainly circumspect that there are circumstances that can be beyond can be beyond our control as well. Mm -hmm. So whilst we're coping, we don't have the systemic failure or the systemic challenges that other local authorities have. Um, where we're able to, we're stepping in with prevention. Um, so, for example, we've recently changed our allocation policy to afford more preference or priority to domestic abuse in order to try to alleviate that form of housing need out with the homelessness uh, uh, context. We have briefed our elected members on the national picture and we keep things under review because we can only be a bad quarter or two away from potentially you know, uh, hitting some of the same challenges, and we're, we're very conscious of that. OK, thanks. Thanks very much. Stephen? Very similar to what Edward said there. In terms of North Lanarkshire, we are the largest local authority social landlord, 36,000 houses. Um, so our overall size helps as well, but although the, the overall size, our waiting list um, has been up 9 per cent in the last uh, year, our homeless presentations in the last year have increased by 16 per cent, significantly higher than the national average at 4 per cent, and 13 per cent a year before. Um, some of the stuff Donna said in terms of affordability, North Lanarkshire where, where we are, there is affordability, so we don't have the pressures that some of the other councils have. So in terms of the private sector, then the ho average house prices are, remain below the national average. They're getting there, so there's still a degree of, um, of, of affordability. We're definitely probably in the, the, the most difficult period I've ever experienced in my professional career. So I'm not saying we're not in an emergency. We have made the decision in North Lancashire not to declare an emergency, but we're probably not far away from it, and certainly the pressures we're under are significant. Uh, in terms of all the other stuff, Donna mentioned about um, percentage lets at 50 per cent. Our target was 37 per cent. However, we're running about 60, between 50 and 60 per cent, mm. and that in itself is assisted to a certain extent, but that's also a risk. And the higher you go, mm. you stop turn, the churn. We need the churn at all times. We need houses to be coming in. We need people in temporary accommodation. They need to go through. And some of the stuff we'd already presented was about the delays and voids and what we've done for that. So are we close to a housing emergency? I would say we absolutely are. Mm. Um, have we decided to declare one? No. Uh, I'm actually hoping that we've now hit that peak when I'm looking at the trends and the data. And I, I hate to say it, but I desperately hope we've, we've hit the peak. Um, we've actually saw in the last six months, homeless presentations have actually stayed very stable. So although we went up 16% and 13% over the last or the first six months of this year, we're seeing about 200 presentations a month, which is the same as we were last year. So we're not seeing that significant increase again this year. And a lot of that is about all the prevention people mentioned before, the prevention work that we're doing. But um, are we close to a housing emergency? Is there systemic failure? There absolutely is. But at the moment, we've decided not to. It's more about the prevention and all the work we're doing to combat that just now. OK, great. Thanks. Blair. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, members. <clears throat> In terms of my understanding of a housing emergency, you've heard really a comprehensive mm -hmm. reasons of why people would declare those. But there were some that were missing for me. And it is about the cut to the affordable housing supply programme. That's a key determinant and factor in us being able to meet current and future demands. Um, we are seeing that social rented stock is limited. What we see across the sector in Scotland as well is actually there's quite a low turnover of properties in Scotland, which Stephen just referred to, but it's crucial in terms of getting a throughput to allocate those tenancies to, to individuals that may be experiencing homelessness or those that are in our other groups and lists that have housing uh, need as well. 
We see challenges uh, being presented by rising investment requirements, so that puts pressure on your housing revenue account in terms of the new legislation that's been applied. And while well intended, that has a significant revenue implication for us in terms of how we would then redistribute that to pay for capital expenditure. Um, in addition to that, um, we have um, other factors that are impacting on our availability of housing through our resettlement programmes as well. They are causing a challenge for us um, in terms of the wider market. Um, and I wouldn't underplay, and it was referenced in the earlier session, about the complexities that our officers at the front line are having to deal with day in, day out, with a complex issue. Getting the house is actually just part of the story. There's a whole plethora of support mechanisms that need to be in place to get a really balanced uh, to sustain um, housing. Uh, for, for those that get it. In terms of an East Ayrshire context, if I may, convener, what we are seeing is slightly different from the rest of Scotland. We are seeing lower levels, uh, lower time within temporary accommodation than the Scottish average, but it is increasing. We are seeing less numbers in temp. We are probably at pre-pandemic levels of the number of presentations. We did see a spike 22-23. We're about 18 per cent down on that. Um, we are looking to reduce the amount of temporary accommodation we have. Within East Ayrshire, we have quite a flat housing market, which helps. Therefore, our PRS is broadly aligned to the local housing allowance rate. Therefore, that doesn't put huge pressures on us in terms of homelessness at the moment, but it does cause pressure. Um, and we see our PRS being somewhere in the region of 35% on average, less than the Scottish average. Uh, we see lower levels of repeat homelessness as well um, in East Ayrshire. Thank you. OK, great. Thanks very much for... For those responses and actually you started to touch in on some other areas i wanted to to um talk about i just um I'll, I'll, i'm going to come back with this um, one bit because i think it's, you've all kind of touched in on work you're doing but just um and then maybe this is more for blair and edward than stephen because you say you're teetering on the edge of maybe declaring an emergency but just be interested to hear if there's anything more you want to say around work you might have done um, I've been doing that's prevented the need to declare a housing emergency. Edward, how's it going in Murray? Yeah, I'd, I'd made, mentioned about the change to the allocation policy, mm. and I think that's important in terms of prevention. Mm. Uh, the other thing that we did within the last year was to augment our frontline service. So we've uh, increased that by one homelessness officer, um, and that's in order to keep control, I suppose, of the opportunity for early intervention for prevention and you know, to, 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 to get other outcomes than uh, requiring individuals to present as homelessness, because that then becomes, I think, when you lose control of that front end, right. that can become something that you're chasing your tail and you're putting the resource into, I suppose, processing and, uh, and facilitating homelessness rather than preventing and resolving it. So I think that's the, that's the main factors that we've um, entered into uh, within the Murray context. Great. Thanks very much. Blair? Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Convener. Uh, so in 22-23, I referenced that we'd seen quite a significant increase in presentations. Therefore, we did a deep dive in terms of our data to see what it told us. So actually what we did is we pushed up front prevention work for our officers. We enhanced their training that rolled out not only those that work in our housing options teams, but those that actually work in our, our, our housing teams as well. So we really went at it at a case of trying to prevent homelessness. What mm -hmm. we did is we uh, amalgamated our housing options, our homelessness team, with our housing teams and our housing support teams, okay. which was really, it's still proving really beneficial in terms of having a really good awareness of what's happening in our communities and those individuals that may or may not be at risk of homelessness. They are, we are then therefore able to take much earlier action mm -hmm. to prevent homelessness. So we are seeing our prevent cases rise significantly, but actually the outcomes of which are really, really positive. What we also introduced is recognising that we all, like we all have, is we all have trades in and out of our houses most days or every day of the year. We introduced a forum called Our Street Forum, and simply this forum was just to recognise any signs of tenancy stress that may be happening in our communities, and it's simply a referral back into base. We assess that. It can lead to a, an adult support protection or referral or a child protection referral, but it could simply just be about triggering an early warning sign for uh, there is maybe a support requirement in that house, and then we send our teams out proactively to try and uh, manage that circumstance. Thank you. Okay, so just to clarify, that's so that's a forum that somebody in the trades is going into a house might see something, and could. So my portfolio is much broader than housing. So actually, I have circa one thousand staff that are briefed on our street forum. So I have okay. bin men reporting circumstances within our communities as well as housing specific. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks very much. I'm going to bring in 
Fulton McGregor, I believe, Fulton, you've got mm -hmm. some questions specifically for North Lanarkshire, is that right? Yes, uh, thank you, convener, um, and good morning to the panel. I'm hoping that you can hear me okay yes. just now. Can do. The network issue has been resolved. Yes, ex thank you very much, convener. Um, yeah, I, I'll keep my question specific to uh, to Stephen Llewellyn from North Lanarkshire Council, uh, who, who I'll, I'll, I'll just declare as a matter of interest that, that I know is a work uh, well with Stephen my roles in, as an MSP and his roles as uh, Chief Housing Officer. Um, Stephen, one of the things I wanted to ask you about that, that might have been uh, that might be helpful for the committee is that I know that uh, North Lanarkshire Council have got a quite ambitious plan actually to acquire 100 properties this year via the Open Market Purchase Scheme. I'm just wondering if you could share, if you're able to share, what lessons you have learned from this and what else you think the council and other councils perhaps could do to extend and improve the buyback scheme to increase stock levels. Okay, thanks very much, Fulton, who writes to me on a regular basis every other day in terms of housing need in North Lanarkshire. The, the council have actually bought back 770, sorry, 767 houses in the last six years through the open market purchase scheme. Initially, it was basically buying vacant, empty properties. We have now changed. Blair mentioned about prevention. Prevention is absolutely everything at the moment, um, not just in terms of housing emergency, but at any point in time. Um, and if you get it right, it will certainly help. So we've expanded our open market purchase scheme, and the, the ambition this year was 100. We probably actually hope we'll, we'll buy back 150. But we, we no longer just buy, buy back vacant properties. We also buy back the last in a block of flats. Every council will probably experience the same, or every housing association as well, the same issue where we struggle to do certain repairs because of owner-occupiers, private landlords as well, who will not contribute to certain repairs. So we're, we're, we're trying to buy back the last one in the block that's been bought so we get full ownership, so we can go out there and do all the necessary work for roof and render, energy efficiency measures. In addition, we're also buying back houses where there's a private landlord who wants to sell and there's a tenant in there. In the past, we wouldn't have bought that. A uh, private landlord then sells, goes to the tribunal, sells, and that becomes a homeless case. In terms of homeless prevention, if we buy it with a certain tenant, then we're preventing homelessness. And also, in terms of North Lanarkshire, private landlord rents, um, although they're affordable across most areas in Scotland, they're still significantly high. And in the main, it's a lot of ex-council stock that was bought. So we're buying back a proper tenor block that uh, we're preventing homeless and the rent halves overnight as well. Average uh, rent for a block house in North Lanarkshire and Coat Bridge area and Fulton area, £750-£800. Average council rent, £350-£400. So there's a lot of benefits in there. In the past, it would have really just been about buying back that empty property. So it's an additional stock coming in. So someone would get it from the homeless list or through the wider. Um, so at some point within the council, we had to obviously to convince people it was a good idea to do, um, but it does prevent homeless. So it's much, much wider, and if other councils are not doing it, I would certainly suggest it's something you should look at, not just vacant properties, but it does prevent homelessness. It's a really good thing to do. And it's also cost-effective. That's the final thing I'd like to quickly say. In terms of the buybacks, average buyback in North Lanarkshire is 70000 80000 The cost of new builds £250,000 £300,000 just now. So um, average cost to, to bring that up to our standards is about £20,000 just now. So on average, between ninety and one hundred against nearly 300000 So we can buy back three for the price of a new bill just now, and it's a quick, easy way to do it. Absolutely. That's my phrase I use a lot. Three for the price of one these days. Um, yeah, Fulton, do you have any further questions? Yeah, th thanks, Stephen. I think that, that was really helpful. Yeah, probably just one further question. I don't want to step in any other members' uh, toes around voids, because I know that's an area we'll be coming to. So just, just specifically for yourself, Stephen, then I wondered if uh, you were able to talk about the... The void, uh, the void situation in North Lanarkshire and how you ensure these uh, are managed effectively. Because um, I know that there is actually a good story here again for North Lanarkshire Council uh, around voids. So I wonder if you would be able to elaborate on that. So the void rate overall in North Lanarkshire is actually very, very good now. Uh, a lot of work has been, been done with our partners, uh, contractors, in terms of overall quality and level as well. We have a void plus standard where we decorate all properties. And we've also found that helps in terms of sustaining tenancies as well. A lot of tenancy failures in the past, people going into a house, a lot of work needing done and they couldn't cope with the work. Um, but the void days overall has not been impacted in recent times. We did, and I think everybody had mentioned uh, over the last number of years, certainly with Alacho as well, 
Um, utility companies were an absolute nightmare and continue to be a bit of a nightmare. We get more and more rig meters now because of the, 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 the issue with energy efficiency and people uh, struggling with their energy costs. We are finding more and more void houses come back. The meters have been rigged trying to get a metre fixed and utility companies to come out. I have staff sitting all day at times. We make appointments and I've got staff sitting at the house all day and no one turns up. And dealing with the utility companies, and I'm sure the vast majority of other local authorities will say the same. If I've got any plea to the committee, it would be if we could do something to force utility companies with a timescale. Um, to actually respond and fix the problem. Houses can be sitting, the, the longest I had last year was a house sitting for 14 months and there was appointment after appointment. You're on the phone all day trying to make appointments. Appointments are made and they're regularly broke. Um, so if there's one plea I would say to the committee if we could do something. One of the local MSPs told me before that the issue is utility companies, it's not devolved, uh, it's the UK government and we don't have a lot of control over it. But if we could get some done with the utility companies and it sped up the, the return of the void, uh, and it, it might sound something really silly and something, something really easy, but it would actually greatly assist all local authorities. Point, um, and that's not those things are not silly. Those are the things that we need to understand because sometimes it's a bit of a mystery as to why yeah. things are not happening. And um, that's uh, certainly a really good point. Um, I hope your toes don't feel too stepped on, Willie Coffey. Um, but I'd like to bring you in on these questions, and you can obviously bring that to other members on the panel. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, I love it when colleagues say that they don't want to step on another question another members will ask, and then just proceed to do it anyway. <laughs> Love doing that, but I was I was interested to hear um, from the authorities that haven't yet declared an emergency that they are taking action in response to the emergency situation declared by others. That's really really encouraging, and I just wanted to quickly ask about the void situation across the board. We've got five authorities in front of us, and we heard extensively from Derek and the good work that they're doing in Edinburgh. I think Derek, you said you've brought 500 voids back already. So it's just to get a flavour from the other authorities, what what part does this play in recovering the voids back into the lighting pool to, to, to tackle this particular problem? And if you're able to just share some numbers in your own authority for the committee, that would be really, really helpful. Maybe you could start with Donna, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, we are stock transfer, so I'm kind of speaking on behalf of our RSLs here, but voids are not a big issue for us, so they're not going to play a significant role in the emergency response. Um, and while, while I'm speaking, I guess I could always raise the issue that, you know, this is a challenge that we find is a lot of the targeted national support and funding is um, deployed in a way where we are struggling to take up those opportunities or, or, or use that funding as part of our emergency response. Blair, what's happening in East Ayrshire with void management and the ability so, to bring them back into the letting pool? Yeah, so this morning I've got 138 voids in East Ayrshire, all of which are at different stages in the process of being reallocated. What we do in East Ayrshire is actually much like Stephen does from an asset management perspective, is we tend to do a lot of our housing improvement works while the property is void, so that there's less impact on our tenants when they move in. Again, for similar reasons, we can prove that it links to greater sustainability. Uh, if they get a modern property, that's all the work's done for them, if, essentially before they move in. Um, however, what we see as a downside is it does impact on our time taken to relet. So we are above this. We are at about 60 days on average to return our voids. But what I would say, and it's important, I recognise a lot of conversations that's been happening through Alacho is that we're all experiencing across the sector is the condition of which voids are returned to us are causing us significant challenges through the, the measures that Stephen had mentioned. But actually, in terms of the condition of properties, therefore it takes us much, it's taking us much longer to return those voids. So in terms of voids being one of the solutions, it will be one of the tools in the toolbox, Willie, but it will not be the panacea in terms of addressing the, the housing emergency we have. Stephen, then, and follow on the void story in North Lanark? <laughs> no, it remains very, very good. 30 days on average, uh, as Blair said, we, we, we try to do capital works as well, whether it's kitchens and bathrooms. If heating system needs to, heating system needs to be upgraded, we'll do it as well. Um, so at the moment, it's a really good news story. Um, it could be better, as I said, in terms of um, utility companies and the, the issues we have there. Uh, as of this morning, 225 voids, but 225 voids out of 36,500. That's probably our lowest level, actually, in the last few years. This time last year, we were over 400. We're at the point now, we're at the natural turnover, in my opinion, just now. But if, 
when we do increase the percentage of lets to homeless, it also reduces the numbers of voids, and that is a risk because you do need a void turnover. You need a turnover for the waiting list. There's 15,000 people on the waiting list in North Lanarkshire. Um, so even just quickly talking about a new build, if a new build property, if I've got 100 new builds, if I allocate the 100 to the statute to homeless, it's 100 and that it finishes there. If I've got 100 new build and there's a percentage that go to homeless, percentage to the general list, percentage to transfers, it creates a churn. So 100 new builds could actually give me 300 voids, and 300 voids is a good thing um, as long as you're getting them allocated quickly because you're, you're reducing the waiting list by 300 rather than just 100. Um, so a lot of good things happening there. So I, I'm happy with where we're at just now and the work that we've done in terms of the overall void levels, but I'm worried that we need to actually have more of a churn just now to create um, to, to take people off the waiting list. OK. Thanks for that, Stephen Edwards. And Murray, have you, have you found that... that uh, trying to tackle the voids um, has helped additionally to, to try to reduce the emergency situation that everybody's talking about. Is it, is it given a new impetus to, to actually looking at the void picture? And maybe you could share your, your experience in Murray with us, Edward. Thank you. It certainly helped. Um, we peaked at about 76 days average void time uh, just during the pandemic uh, in 2021. We've managed to get that down to 35 days. The way we went about that was an end-to-end -end process review of just how efficiently we were both inspecting and arranging the works within the properties. We did, within that period, have extensive issues with utility companies, which, you know, whilst we've not totally cracked them, they've certainly reduced significantly in terms of uh, their impact on the overall uh, sort of journey. Um, we've also managed to um, you know, come up with differentiated processes for the poor condition properties coming in, and we've got a different approach to tackling those as those that maybe just need more of a sort of safety check and you know sort of uh, clean as such. So we've managed to you know to sort of have. Uh, I suppose accelerated programmes for the easier to turn around properties, and you know, getting more sort of multi-trade uh, approaches to those that require both the capital investment that Stephen's uh, referenced, as well as you, you know those that require a bit of damage to be sort of repaired. We're down at uh, about 70 properties, and that's roughly just over one percent. And I think that's that nat natural turnover figure that we could uh, expect to see. But turnover does remain a challenge overall. It's reduced year on year um, for the last several years. And it does give us fewer properties, obviously, to then to allocate to the various housing needs, including homelessness. OK, thanks for that. My, my other question was really about support that you're getting from the Scottish Government, or would hope to get from the Scottish Government. And maybe I could start with, with Derek this time. Derek, how does Edinburgh see that? What support have you had? What do you need to try and help you further? I mean, cash and resources might be the, the obvious thing, but what other types of support does Edinburgh need to try to tackle this problem? Um, thanks. Um, work well with, <coughs> excuse me, work well with Scottish Government colleagues um, across more homes, across better homes, uh, divisions. Um, Funding is an obvious one, and there's ongoing discussions there. And, and like I said, we're um, having ongoing meetings uh, at the moment with um, Sean Neill's team around how we respond to the emergency and what support is available. Um, there, there's obvious issues like local housing allowance, those issues that have been well well played out, I think, in the, in the previous um, panel. Um, investment, how um, how money is provided, um, the proportions of money that's provided in terms of where the where the housing demand is for new houses, um, where the demographic changes, so matching that more to what the demographic changes in the, in the country uh, are likely to be, for example, I think would be helpful how we work um, with institutional investors. So I'm a member of the, the, the Housing Minister's Housing Investment Task Force, so, so, so well versed there in the work that's, that's ongoing. Um, there are um, issues like general fund subsidy of the HRA, um, ministerial approval being needed, um, and how that works, um, what that looks like, what the, the current HRA guidance says, that the HRA guidance is now 13 years old. So is it still um, the right guidance? Is it, is it fit for purpose? Um, because the, the economy has changed, I think, probably a couple of times since it was published. So that there are practical things there um, mirroring, certainly affordable housing supply, um, mirroring um, what's happening in the country in terms of demographic change, as I said. Um, I think there's also some issues um, to be looked at around prevention. Um, we have a very strong prevention, as other colleagues um, you've heard 
Um, we are so an example would be we, we are likely to prevent homelessness for around 450 households this year, and that's based on uh, statutory returns. That will avoid about £10 million worth of costs for us. Um, so it's really good work, really good performance. Homelessness is still going up. So that's despite th th that prevention. Um, so what we're working with the Scottish Government on and with colleagues, NHS Lothian through their data lock, uh, University of Edinburgh through the Edinburgh Futures Institute and the Smart Data Foundry, around how do we prevent homelessness? What does predicting homelessness look like? Where is there a pathway emerging through health, through mental health appearances and presentations at hospital, a &E, etc., alcohol, drug misuse? How do we understand that? How do we plan it? And how do we build a, a model using data that we understand across the public sector that can really prevent homelessness and not um, six months down the line, but two, three years down the line, because there's evidence that that's there. There's public health research that shows that. So I think there's a lot of support would be good in there, but also really valuable in terms of Scottish Government taking a lead on how do we do this properly, how do we uh, synthesise all this data and actually give a model that, that helps us do that. Um, really, I think there's also questions about, about legislation. Um, I mean, I, I, I have a concern that the, the housing bill, as it currently stands, not, not about the contents of it, but it's been scrutinised in different ways. When you know, this committee will scrutinise the, the PRS section, social justice, the, the homelessness prevention aspect. And I concern that there isn't a coherence across that scrutiny and how the different parts apply to each other. I think, I think there's some really important work there to be done as well. So I think there's, there's a range of things, funding absolutely, but I think being really serious and deliberate about what a, a data identification and prevention model would look like, I think would be really helpful. And they're, they're discussions we're having with colleagues at the moment. Thanks for that. Derek, that's pretty extensive there, so maybe to ask my other colleagues for a, perhaps a more briefer uh, uh, <laughs> contribution there and what, what you see the Scottish <laughs> Government having done for you so far, what you could, more importantly, what you would expect the Scottish Government to do, and, and also we're aware of the consequentials coming from UK budget, so could you just uh, offer a few suggestions there about how we should take this forward? Donna. Okay, um, I'll, be, I'll be very brief, but you know, absolutely funding is really important. So that targeted capital and revenue support to help us overcome market failure in our region. Um, I know it's been said a couple of times, I'm sorry I'm going to say it again, but we really need to work with the UK government on these freezes to the local housing allowance rates. You know, we need to see the value of that restored um, and a review of the broad rental market areas as well, because it's not only impacting affordability in our region, it's impacting our ability to develop other affordable tenures, such as mid-market rent. So for us, the LHA is very, very significant. Um, and then I think the other big one for us is just applying more flexibility in the funding arrangements. And there's quite a lot that I could probably talk to on that one. Um, so I won't really go into too much detail unless you want me to. But, um, you know, we need the sort of national policy and the framework to really empower us locally so that we can use these opportunities to respond to our own quite unique local circumstances. Um, so those would be the big ones from Scottish Borders perspective. Thanks, Donna. Lily, can I just yep. into the mix, um, the piece around um, housing revenue account and what you think about that, because Derek brought that up. And the fact that you have to speak to ministers if you want, and I think up to, to if you want to add to the general, you know, add to that pot from the general fund, and and I think up to this point, no council has actually ever done it, and that's partly what Derek was saying. Partly the guidelines are not clear, so it'd be interesting to hear because that could be a way that you could get more funding. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a really good question. Unfortunately, as stock transfer, we don't have a housing revenue account, so I'm going to leave that one to the other panel Lucky members. You. They'll be able to respond more expertly. <laughs> Um, but but what, I, what I would maybe highlight, just as an example for us, is that last year we actually, despite being in a housing emergency, underspent on our supply programme allocation. Now, there are things that we could have done with that funding. We could have spent it in different ways, but obviously, you, you know, we're kind of tied to, to the framework that we have at the moment. Um, but equally, at the same time, you know, huge viability gaps in projects locally meant that, as a council, we put in over two and a half million of our own resources to support these projects to deliver affordable housing when at the same time we're not able to spend the funding that is being made available from the Scottish Government. So that alongside many other sort of examples sort of tells me that the arrangements are just not working for us um, in the Scottish borders. So, you know, we'd be keen to push for 
for more local administrative control over that funding in future, or, or okay. whatever that, whatever the future funding arrangements might look like. Okay, thanks, Blair. Thank you, convener. Um, I suppose labouring the point about additional money to stimulate new build is significantly important. The sector welcomed recent increases in our grant level fundings. However, it did not go anywhere close to being far enough to allow us to stimulate good growth for social rented uh, housing. So I think that's really, really important. We need longer term funding planning as well. Uh, three years is not long enough to plan. Uh, we need much longer certainty. Um, one year funding of RRTP money isn't sufficient for us to make a sustained difference. Um, however, I will touch on, uh, importantly, Derek picked up some areas that I'm really passionate about, and it's actually about the distribution of funds. Not only are we housing providers, actually what we do through housing is improve health, well-being, life, ex life expectancy, educational attainment, ability to, to get employment, and actually that's the impact that we're making. So actually it's about that connected uh, po uh, public policy that needs to be connecting and uh, actually look where is driving, the, where, what is the driver from this, and it could be through housing, therefore the funds should be distributed accordingly, in my view. Um, in terms of the HRA, I'm coming with a health, health warning a little with that. I understand the merits of it. However, this is our tenants' rent. Our tenants are paying their rent, which is allowing us to invest in their stock, and therefore they need to be the absolute beneficiary of any investment that we look to make. That's simply my comment. Thank you. Stephen? I pretty much agree with a lot of what's been said. Very, very briefly then, fund and finance, uh, so I'll not go over. I agree with what most people have said. The LHA as well, in terms of um, the allowances being frozen over a, a long period of time, which is definitely putting an impact on a couple of addition th additional things. In North Lanarkshire, 64 per cent of homeless presentation Homeless presentations are from single people, 46 per cent male, um, 16 to 18 per cent female. So in terms of the allocation side, the other part of that, then the vast majority of stock that turns over in North Lanarkshire is a two-bedroom. That's what was built over the years. So we will allocate a two-bedroom property to a single person. A lot of housing associations have got a housing policy that they will not because of the concern about the bedroom tax going forward. If they do that, then they could end up with a significant funding shortfall with the bedroom tax. The Scottish Government, as you know, is fully mitigating against that just now, but if that ever changes, there's a risk. So there's a number of housing associations who will not allocate a two-bedroom house to... So the percentage lets to homelessness in North Lancashire with the RISL sector on a whole is very, very low. And that's something I've already spoke to the regulators. So that's maybe something for the committee to consider as well. That, um, that, that, so the housing policies of a number of RSLs is actually impacting and actually making the situation with the housing emergency worse because they will not allocate that two bedroom to a single person. So I say two thirds of people declaring homeless or present as homeless in North Lancashire are single. But uh, the housing associations will not, and they don't have a turnover of one bedroom, so they're not doing their share overall. Um, Thanks, Stephen. Finally, Edward. Yeah, thank you. I, th I think to echo the stability of I think funding and, and policy as well. You know, we've heard from the academics about the impact of the private renters, rented sector interventions. I'll maybe focus on a couple of issues. You know, based on the sort of north and rural area. Um, one is the rural housing fund. Um, that the, the access that we have to that is limited uh, within the Murray context. So, for example, for key workers for Dr Grace Hospital in Elgin. Um, that's not uh, deemed to be within the rural area, uh, whereas you know within a commuting distance of some of the big cities it would be. So I think there's a degree, and we've raised that with our More Homes uh, colleagues. There's also been some localised issues in terms of access to, for local development trusts to the upfront funding to help with their design and sort of business case development, uh, and that is inhibiting uh, some progress at a local level with, uh, with, with some of that. And finally, to focus on uh, prevention, um, whilst prevention is critical at the root of this, some of the um, opportunities for prevention are limited by the changes uh, to local connection. If people aren't becoming homeless within your local area, you've got less opportunity. I say this is probably a net beneficiary. I think you know, probably Murray would see more people gravitate towards cities, as is not uncommon uh, when homelessness arises. Uh, so I think at a national policy level, I don't think that's necessarily um, given all the tools to the, the, the local authorities that are responding to that. And that does cut across the national resettlement programmes as well, because the opportunities for prevention are clearly limited, and therefore there's more of a response going to, going to be needed, and it's going to be disproportionately felt in local authorities and urban centres.
Thanks very much, Edward. Thank you. Can Thanks you? very much. Just, Edward, can I just come back and uh, pick up on the, the HRH? Just to be clear, my understanding is that this wouldn't affect the tenants, Blair. It would be that there would be additional money if councils wanted to put additional money from the general fund into the HRH pot, you have to ask permission at the moment from ministers. And also, uh, so, so I think up to this point, no council's done it, partly because the guidelines aren't clear. So is there something that we could do in, in that area to help um, bring clarity? So is there any interest in that in, that in Murray? Um, I think it's theoretical. Um, we, I, I couldn't hope to have a business case to go uh, with our general services deficit at the moment to be asking for any money. Uh, but I would agree with Derek that I think the HRA guidance uh, would be helpful to be reviewed, given the contextual changes uh, since that's last been done, and with a focus on some of these acute challenges that, okay. that we're currently facing. Thanks. Derek. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I think just to, to expand on that, I think one of the difficulties with the, the general fund subsidy issue is um, the budget cycle. So Scottish mm -hmm. Government budget will be set um, probably January, um, and then most councils will have to do that by the end of March, probably try and do it in February. So that there's an issue with developing the business case, understanding what the settlement was, what you might need, what you might want to subsidy. Um, and it's theoretical because we're not doing it, but it's a, it's a question that's going around. So. Um, I guess the angle would be that um, local councils are democratically elected um, organisations that know how to spend their money. Why is the ministerial approval needed to do that? Um, and the timelines don't necessarily allow it. So there's something about that legislative process of doing it. I think it's more that the, the guidance is relatively clear. It's the timescales that might prevent it happening if a council was to want to. And so there's a kind of maybe an assumed consent model rather than um, having to having to go to the minister. And it's theoretical because, you know, I don't think we're looking to do it. It's just the, the concept of it, just yeah. to clarify. Yeah, great. Thanks very much for that. And I'm going to bring in Fulton McGregor um, again. Fulton, are you there? Maybe not. Okay. Hello. Oh, um, good. You are. Well, convener, I didn't uh, ask to come back in. Um, you've got question number six. Oh, I think that was the previous panel. I'm happy to do that if you want, no convener. That's absolutely no problem. Well, okay. that is it. All right, thanks very much. <sighs> thanks, convener. Was a, a, a wee surprise that I got an additional question there. Um, so in, in terms of a question, I'd like to ask the panel. The Scottish Government has emphasised the need for the UK Government uh, involvement as a you know, more joint working um, and arguing for the abol abolition of the bedroom tax and the restoration of the LHA rates. What did the panel think that this, uh, uh, if these were, if these were measures that were implemented, how do how do they think that this could help solve the underlying housing emergency in Scotland and particularly in your own local areas? Who wants to pick that up first, Derek? My, my microphone's open. <laughs> I think it would make a huge difference. I think there's a number of areas to work with UK government, um, including the, the asylum policies and, and refugee, etc. But concentrating on this one, I think it would make a huge difference. So, so the figures I've got in front of me, for example, so a three-bedroom house, the weekly shortfall between the local housing allowance and the average rent in Edinburgh per week is £121.11. So you're going on £500 a month. That's poverty. It's you know, it's putting food on the table, it's putting clothes on your back. So there's the housing element of it, but, but as Blair mentioned, that wider public health lens around what we're able to do, how families are able to support themselves is, is you know, it's fundamental. Um, housing is a huge part of it, but it, it's an enabling system, absolutely. But that, that change would make a huge difference. Um, in Edinburgh, we've got one in five children in poverty. A, a, a move like that, a change like that would make a huge difference to their lives. OK, thanks. Donna? Um, yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with Derek. It, it, it would um, it would make a massive change. I, I suppose, you know, maybe we need to caveat that a little bit by being careful that that doesn't inadvertently increase rents, market rents locally. But, you know, as a council, we are absolutely on board and this is what we've been asking for for a long time. But, you know, again, it kind of goes back to having all of the data and the measures and actually being able to to measure whether policy decisions like this are having the intended consequences that we hope and expect that they will have. Okay, great. Blair. 
Uh, thank you. Yeah, exactly like Derek says. However, given the statistics that I set out, er set out earlier, as a local context in terms of East Ayrshire, the increase may cause us some challenges in terms of additional pressure for people that don't already have the pressure, but I fully recognise why the wider cities, Edinburgh, Glasgow, mm. etc., would absolutely be advocating for that change. Yeah, thanks. But it's helpful, isn't it, to really understand it's a nuanced approach depending on the circumstances. Stephen, what, what's going on in North Lanarkshire? I agree with what's been said in terms of the LHA, just what I said earlier as well. The biggest reason for homelessness in North Lanarkshire is relationship breakdown, and that's where I said, nearly two-thirds of the applicants are single people, so mm -hmm. the abolition of the bedroom tax would be greatly welcomed. We have just under 7,000 current tenants who have been mitigated by the bedroom tax, and we're receiving the funding for that. But going forward, in terms of people coming on the waiting list, uh, as I said, that is a barrier just now to some of the RSL's policies in terms of house sizes. So the abolition of the bedroom tax would be extremely welcome mm. from North, a North Lancashire perspective. Right. Thanks. And how about in Murray? Yeah, I think it, it certainly wouldn't be unhelpful. It would, it would be uh, beneficial to, I suppose, give access, you know, realistic access to a greater number of properties. I think the point that Donna had made as well earlier about the broad housing market areas, um, Murray is divided, not necessarily along housing market, you know, in reality lines with the old sort of divide between Aberdeen and Inverness postcodes, um, and uh, you know, it throws up disparities in terms of higher rent levels in one area where actually the, the market rents are a bit lower and then not kind of keeping pace in, in the other area. So I think we could do with a bit more of an intuitive look at that as well. OK, great. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm now going to bring in Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. Earlier on, when I was asking the previous panel, we touched on some of the medium and long term issues uh, about the, the housing system and how that is managed. Uh, but it would be quite interesting to touch on the uh, Housing 2040, which is, as you know, is one of the uh, Scottish Government's actions. And there are a number of actions within that process that talk about taking uh, housing markets so that it operates fairly and provides affordable housing options and choices in all communities. Now, that's a huge ask uh, for you uh, as, as councils uh, to try and to manage that and implement some of that that's coming through as an action. But it would be good to find out if you do think there are any progress on that aim uh, and what else needs to be done from that aim to make sure that uh, there might be progress and the role that you would have as a council in trying to provide and support that action, uh, or is it an action that you think is not achievable uh, from within your complex and the role that you have within the council? And I'll maybe start with Derek and just move round. Yeah, thanks um, for the question. Um, my, my initial thoughts are that um, I don't think that housing is seen as a public health issue in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And it is. It's fundamental in public health issue. Um, and I think there's many merits to the Housing 2040 terms of reference, the board, the board set up. But when I look at it, I don't see NHS That's there. I don't see skills development Scotland. I don't see higher education there. Yeah. And I think if we're tackling housing, and I think if we're to meet the aims of the Housing 2040 board, yeah. uh, the, the, the aims, not the terms of reference, but the aims that are there, I think there has to be a much wider... Um, representation from wider public sector in order to provide the skills, understand what we need to get into the construction sector, etc. So there's a whole a whole other discussion about that. So um, I think um, it's positive but um, not wide enough membership mm -hmm. to set the policy. And and the council role, what role do the, you the, see the that? Well I think I think the council role is to to an extent do what we need to do locally mm. and feed into it. So we've just established a strategic housing partnership under a community planning umbrella um, to to effectively do that, to make sure there's a civic stamp on housing in the city with all relevant bodies, um, including Social Security Scotland, DWP, Skills Development, etc., mm. to, to make sure we do that at a local level. Um, and that would involve uh, Homes for Scotland as well in terms of construction. So I think there's a doing what you need to do locally and progress to support. Yeah. Thank you. Donna? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think Derek made some, some really, really good points there. I suppose I would, what I would reiterate from this morning's session with the other panel members is that the position that we're in now has developed over such a significant period of time. Um, you know, short-term actions are probably not really going to work. It's going to take many, many, many years. So we need to be looking really, really long-term, which Housing to 2040 does or did. 
Um, it, you know, we agree with almost everything that's in there. We think it's a really, really good foundation, but what we need is the long-term sustainable funding, capital, revenue support. We also need the input from other sectors, because as Derek touched on, housing outcomes cut across so many aspects of our society. So housing measures that we're taking now or that we'll be delivering through Housing for 2040, it's really, really important that we're using those as a tool to ease the pressures across other sectors. As, as you mentioned, like health and social care is a very, very good example, but um, you know, it feeds into educational attainment, employment opportunities, um, particularly in our region, um, the prosperity of, of mm -hmm. our region and the economic development behind that. So I'm not, you know, not entirely sure what our role yet might be, but we've already got our kind of regional housing action plan, our local housing strategy, and we'll continue to feed into and respond to national policy. But the point that I suppose I really, really want to make is just about that long term sustainable certainty across the whole housing market because once we have that it, you know there's room for all tenures and it attracts investment so that's really what we should be aiming for um there's a lot in housing to 2040 and i suppose that needs to be prioritized within the current context as well because as blair touched on earlier you know there's increasing pressures regulations new standards um and you know, there's a lot of questions about how we're going to deliver that in the current Certainly. circumstances. Thank you. Blair? Yeah, thank you. Um, so for me, the milestones within Housing to 2040 absolutely still remain relevant for us as a sector. However, that it does present significant challenges for us, and I'm going to go down the route of affordability. Yeah. You know, so, so if we're talking about a housing emergency, build, 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 or buy, 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 whatever's the best way forward for us to address the emergency that we face, this all costs significant amounts of money. The, the money in which we get from the government is a small proportion of the actual cost to deliver, and that burden is to councils and indeed our tenants. Therefore, I think some of the milestones would be perhaps better reconsidered in terms of their implementation, and I'm referring specifically to the new social housing net zero standards, while I absolutely understand the importance of them. However, the cost to each of us as local authorities is probably unaffordable at this moment in time, no. given the, the other conditions it sits within. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Stephen? Just on what Blair has said, in North Lanarkshire, we're estimating at the moment £3.3 .3 billion pounds it will cost in terms of net zero. Mm -hmm. um, talking about HRA and general funds and stuff like that. So going, up, going, up, going forward, that significant mm -hmm. rent increases with everything else that's going on as well. Uh, we're committed to it. Of course, we're committed to it. But I think it's just... Uh, good to put out there in terms of the kind of cost we are talking about just now. In terms of overall actions, and totally committed to it. In North Lanarkshire, we've got to probably get this in. The, the, the Chief Executive of North Lanarkshire, Des Murray, very, very forward-thinking, very uh, progressive. And in terms of bringing the partners to the table, it's absolutely a partnership. And a number of people, Blair and Derek, have mentioned it as well. Health and well-being is everything, and we don't we no longer work in silos. I've, I've been there a long time ago, where you're working very much on your own health, education, social work, um, all at the table now. Mm -hmm. Certainly in North Lanarkshire, and that's working really, really well. Affordability is everything, but so is appropriateness. The appropriateness of the properties in North Lanarkshire we've started demolishing, which some people might say, why are you demolishing in the time of um, a housing emergency? We'd started before, but we're removing properties that it wasn't even low demand, there were no demand. Mm -hmm. And even if someone went in it, they lasted six months. Um, I've actually knocked down 100 houses in an estate in Wisha, no demand whatsoever. We've just built 100 new houses and have 1,000 people on the waiting list for day. People said you'll have no waiting list. We have put 100 appropriate, affordable houses in place, okay. and we have generated that demand. Uh, and going forward, that that's definitely the way ahead. So it's not just about affordability, but for me, it's also about appropriateness of the stock that you have. Excellent. And then, yeah, thank you. I think just to develop one of the points about the public health approach. You know, this is something that there's a long heritage in, in, mm. in housing, going back to sort of slum clearances and bringing internal bathrooms to properties. So I think you know, we can go full circle and some, sometimes revisiting uh, those kind of key principles. I think the certainty of funding is certainly a, a, an important kind of component of that. 
uh, but also that policy alignment, as uh, Stephen refers, for the, the funding for net zero. Uh, the marginal cost benefit for tenants simply isn't there. Uh, to look at funding that through rents, you know, the, the, would, would definitely have um, unintended consequences there. Mm -hmm. So I think we do need to get that balance right. And I think the proportionality of the policy responses as well. We saw post Grenfell the requirement for sprinkler systems within such social housing properties. That is throwing up you know, such challenges. So we, for example, recently had a former children's home that we were looking to convert yep. back, and we would have had to put a sprinkler system in. And it makes more sense to divest ourselves of that property. Um, instead, in the private rented sector, that wouldn't be required. So I think we just need to look at the, the sort of proportionality of some of those interventions as well. Thank you, convener. I know time is tight, so I'm okay. quite content to yep. let Thanks. Thanks very much. I, I actually am a bit curious um, around appropriateness, Stephen. Could you just unpack that a little bit so we understand? Yeah, I suppose we... we... <laughs> We've all got stock within the area, so although people talk about void, void properties, we'll probably all have stock in certain areas. Uh, certainly in North Lanark, so it was stock that were built in the 60s. Uh, it was stock, some tower blocks. That, that initially, they were only meant to be there for 50 years. Uh, we continue to invest in them, but we also have a lot of low-level flats, bigger flats as well. So some people might say, well, they're three-bedroom flats and a housing emergency, why would you take them away? Over a long period of time, we've all probably had area renewals, we've regenerated, we've spent, we've spent, we've spent, we've done everything, we've offered incentives, but the properties are still not attractive to people on the waiting list. And that's where I'm coming from, the appropriateness of that actual stock in certain areas. And I'm sure every single council will have areas like that. And we've all probably had the debate with ourselves over a period of time, why demolish, why are you going to demolish? People seem to be the waiting list in North Lancashire at the moment. When I talk to people through any list just now, everyone's aspiring. Their aspiration seems to be they want a front and back door, they want a house with a garden, um, and the waiting lists at the moment are, are absolutely full of that. It's a lot of the, certainly the houses we're demolishing. It's, it's ultimately it's flats. It's walk up tenement flats. Strangely, the houses that were built in the twenties, the houses that were built in the forties and fifties, remain really, really high demand in the vast, vast majority of areas in North Lanark. The traditional type houses, but the houses built in the sixties and the early seventies are the houses that we are finding, which are pretty much flats, walk-up flats and tower blocks, have become, as I say, not just low demand but no demand. Uh, when these houses were built, though, the demand was unbelievable. And I suppose we've got to make sure we don't make the same mistakes that we, we, we made there. There's no point in me building houses just now that 30, 40, 50 years from now will be knocking down again. So it's absolutely essential affordability, but the money we have that we're spending it right and building the right houses and the right mix of houses. OK, great. Thanks, that, thanks for uh, meeting my need, my curiosity there about that. Um, I'm going to bring in Megan Gallagher. Uh, Convener, I'm not looking to come in with a question just now. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Apologies. I've got two people on the committee that have initials MG now. I have to be careful about that. I'm going to bring in Mark Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Convener. Um, you heard previously from um, Professor Ken Gibb um, about potential reforms to um, the, the way we operate land and land banks and who that's operating in Scotland. They've published a, a report, um, Sustainable Housing Policy in Scotland, rebooting the Affordable Housing Supply Programme, and talked about creation of um, a, a housing agency and um, compiling land assembly sites to assist both with um, affordable housing supply programmes, but also development programmes for, for private housing construction as well. Um, I don't know if you all heard his comments from the previous section, but just wonder how you think that would potentially interact with council services, although I know you might not all have uh, property services or uh, planning in your remit, and um, if you think that that would work to increase the, the effective land supply for, for housing in Scotland. Um, start on my left with Derek. Thanks. Um... I think, in principle, it, it makes sense. I'm just reflecting. Uh, in, in Edinburgh at the moment, we are quite lucky. We, as a council, we have access to a lot of land, so there's been a, a concerted effort over a, a few years to, to buy land, purchase it, to get um, to get the land available. At, you know, in some some pretty chunky numbers as well in terms of new builds. So, um, I, I'd probably need to see more detail on how that would work. Um, we have a, obviously we're a planning authority. 
um, and we've just published our city plan to 2030. Um, I think the proof's probably in the pudding for that, to use a cliche. I think it, it would that level of interaction, how it was funded and what the remit was. Um, for example, would an agency like that have um, priority over a local council to buy land? I think it's issues like that we would, we would want to know and, and how that's then um, made available to the local council. So probably a wee bit more understanding to see the detail on that. Yeah, I, I mean, we support the principal principles of exploring this and it does sound like there's maybe some merit um, but I would just echo exactly what Derek says without really knowing you know the detail of what it might look like or what role our kind of regional economic partnership might have with that um, I don't think I could really comment uh, thank you much. Like others, the, the devil would be in the detail. I think Ken actually referenced to the importance of local authorities in all of those conversations. So I think we would look clearly like a seat at that table to shape and influence what that might look like. I suppose for balance to me, what would it do differently to LDPs and Section 75s? What, what added value would that give? That would be my question. I'm going to absolutely sit on the fence in this one. I'm going to say until we know more information, then we've, there's no point in me sitting here and making a making a comment on it just now. The, the supply overall of land and the further supply of land is obviously going to be a good thing if we can get more affordable housing built overall. Um, but at the moment, until we know more information, I'm probably going to start on the fence on it. I think for me, there's both the autonomy at a local level that's important, but there's also the funding. You know, We do have a shadow programme that we could uh, get built if we had the funding to support that within Murray. Um, the other observation that Professor Hilber uh, had in relation to the, the cost in rural areas, you know, his expectation across Europe is that it's cheaper. Well, the reality absolutely is mm -hmm. it costs more. There's a lot of that about the small uh, you know, builders, the, 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 the sort of paucity of those and getting things built at scale. And there's a lot of transportation infrastructure costs associated with that. So I think there's a possibly a different look at exactly why the economics of both land zoning and you know sort of cost um, aren't really you know kind of meted out, and what positive interventions could potentially be available by such an approach. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, finally, I, we have to ask this question about the new national outcome. Um, that the government's brought in around housing, that we live in safe, high quality and affordable homes that meet our needs. And you, obviously you heard me. I think all of you were in the room at that point when I asked it to the last panel. But I'd be interested to hear what you think of it and uh, if you think it will help guide the Scottish government's policies to address the housing emergency. And I'm going to start unusually at this end. Edward. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I think my colleague uh, to my right had said the devil's in the detail uh, on a previous question. And I think whilst there's nothing to disagree with within that national outcome aspiration, um, it's, I think, about having a really solid evidence base. I think we heard that from the professors earlier. And the proportionality of any measures therein have made reference to the affordability of the social housing net zero and certainly not being placed wholly on the shoulders of tenants to sort of fund that aspiration. Um, insofar as it is. So I think there's a weighting could be placed in each of those, you know, sort of uh, elements, uh, proportionality. Um, I think the most recent interventions we've had in relation to um, changes to smoke alarms, etc. We all want to keep our tenants safe, but we need to look at, uh, you know, the detail of policy to make sure that it's, uh, is borne out in proportionate terms for the funding that is available to, 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 to put that in place. Okay, thanks. Absolutely welcome it. Um, housing has not been on the national outcome. Uh, reference to housing has not. Housing is, in my opinion, number one fundamental. Mm -hmm. You've good quality housing that brings everything else on in terms of education, attainment for children, health, well-being, the whole lot. So we absolutely welcome housing being included in it. Uh, the concern is going to be obviously just safe, high quality, the kind of measures around about how we measure that. I would quite like the word secured being added in there, but I know that that's maybe not for everybody. But I think everybody should be entitled to both safe and also sec secure high quality housing. Uh, but absolutely welcome it from an okay. architectural perspective. Thanks. Blair. Yeah, absolutely welcome safe, high quality and affordable housing. I was thinking within thriving communities as well to bring mm -hmm. that community element to it would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it brings that place making bit, doesn't it? Donna. Um, yeah, we, we are supportive of, of a new national housing outcome. I mean, I think, you know, we've all touched on it, but the value of housing in terms of our kind of social um, and, a, and its economic contribution really needs to be seen. And I think without 
a specific outcome, it's probably um, not maybe as been as high up on people's radar. So yeah, we welcome it as well. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd welcome it. I think points made by colleagues in the panel um, are really important as well around the thriving communities aspect, public health aspect. So yeah, positive, but devils in the detail. Great. Thanks very much for that. And I think you have today made the made the case certainly that housing is a kind of like a critical point. It's of so many things: education, well-being, poverty, everything. I believe Megan Gallagher, you want to come in with a question. Um, then we will wrap up. Thank you very much, convener, and I appreciate the opportunity to come in with a last-minute question. Um, can I also, similar to Fulton, uh, note uh, that I do regularly work alongside Stephen in relation to uh, localised housing casework. And um, my question is on. Uh, housing waiting lists and indeed the points based system that operates within council areas right up and down the country um, and I'm wondering you know based on what we've heard today in relation to needs and wants aspirations will there be a point that we'll have to adapt the points based system in order to meet modern day housing challenges and I don't know who wants to to kick off I might kick off with Stephen uh, with in relation to North Lanarkshire giving the, the vast amounts of people on housing waiting lists just now. Okay, so I see Stephen and I've seen Derek and anyone else who wants to indicate, Edward? Okay, okay. in North Lancashire, 15,000 people, Megan, as you're aware, on the waiting list. It's been up in the last number of years from 12,000. North Lancashire's housing policy is a needs-led policy. Um, and anybody that puts in a housing application then will, will obviously point. But the key part for us all is housing options and good quality housing options and outlining to people what they're asking for against what they're potentially going, going to be offered. So there are certain areas in your own area that are really, really high demand. There is no turnover whatsoever of housing, and someone will still say, I'll still wait on that three-bedroom semi-detached that's going to come up. We tell them there is not, no such a thing through the right to buy, or if we've got maybe a couple in there that's never turned over, uh, the prospect of going to turn over is, is nil. We need to say you need to be looking at a three-bedroom flat, as we mentioned earlier. There's a turnover in an area a mile from where you are. I wait on that three-bedroom semi-detached. You're going to wait on it. You're not going to get it. But no matter how often um, we tell people in terms of housing options, they, they still have that aspiration for that certain type of house. So it's a difficult one. But housing options and the housing options toolkit that was launched a few years ago is absolutely superb. And it's just about outlining to people well, what the turnover is, what the demand is, and what to expect to be offered. But just to be absolutely clear, the housing allocation policy is very much a needs-led policy just now. But we also have a small element in there in terms of aspirations. Someone who's been in a flat for 20 years will give some kind of preference for them to move out. But it's still very much a need-led policy. Okay. Uh, Derek and Ed Edward. Yeah, thanks. Just building on what Stephen said, so our um, Ed Index um, system has about, I think, 16,000 or so people looking for a house on it. So um, we're the same sort of level. We'll have an average of about 260 bids for each house that becomes available. So um, pretty important in terms of emergency. We are reviewing our allocations policy. It's a key part of our housing emergency action plan. And uh, what we are doing is looking internationally at what different countries, what different cities, capital cities, obviously, in terms of our context, how they do that. Um, so North America, um, Europe, um, Australia, for example, trying to get the best examples that are out there, see what makes sense, see if there's any changes needed, um, and then and take it from there. I know there's work being done through Alacho as well, I think, on allocations policy at a more general level. So there's, there's work underway. Okay. Anybody else want to come in? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, Edward. Yeah. yeah th thank Apologies. you, convener. Um, we've got about 3,500 on our list um, within Murray. Um, again, it's a needs led uh, process, uh, uh, you know, uh, like uh, Stephen has described in North Lanarkshire. I think it's a means to an end in terms of you know, allocating this scarce resource and making sure that we're responding to those that are in greatest need. There are limitations, though, to the approach, um, and I know that you know, there are attributes to choice based lettings that you know, Edinburgh work with. What I would also say is that you know, it's important that we try and capture a greater depth of information there beyond the housing options. So, for example, in some of our rural communities, people will only apply for what they know that we have, you know, so they won't bother putting down some of the communities that actually they may prefer to, to, to live within. So for acquisition and building, it's important that we try to develop and we do develop a depth of additional evidence to inform those uh, processes because that keeps the communities sustainable in some of those rural areas. Blair? 
Um, so, like, exactly like Stephen, we have a waiting list point system which is led by need. What we did in East Ayrshire about 12 or 18 months ago is we introduced an online housing application system. Within that system, it has a mapping uh, system for people's preferences when they're choosing where they want to live. And what it populates is stock and turnover information, which has been really, really helpful in terms of driving people's um, uh, choices of, of where they're then selecting offers of, uh, where they would like to be offered housing based on an, a, a position of good knowledge, the likelihood of being made an offer or not. So what we see, particularly at a housing options team, is we are seeing much more acceptance of first offers than we have seen before in East Ayrshire. Mm. OK, that sounds like a, a good system. Um, I, uh, uh, Megan, do you want to come back in? OK, great, thanks. I um, got a couple of things. One is this aspiration for a semi-detached. I think, Stephen, you were talking about that. Um, where's that? What's driving that? Is it is it because we've got a history of um, flats and things that were poorly built where you could hear your neighbours, you know, every, verbatim kind of thing through the walls, and we've got new technology, building standards now that actually flats and things can be where in you, you, you can't hear people. So mm -hmm. I wonder if we've got an experience of older housing in flats and that kind of setup that then makes us think that it's always going to be like that, but if we use modern-day technology, we could do something better. I think it's an, it's an interesting one in North Lanark, so it's come up in the last few years, and I'm not saying it's like that across the country, because it's probably not in terms of uh, what's going on. It appears to be... So all our new build up to now, we've built two blocks of flats we have built, and both blocks of flats uh, going forward are three high, a four high, and they've lifts in them now. So again, we're future proofing them rather than the old tenements where you're four up and going up and down the stairs. So all our flats going forward will be, but up to now, all the properties we have built have been either cottage flats or front and back doors. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, in itself has driven the expectation in North Lanarkshire. We now have people who are chasing new build sites, and we've never had that before. Mm -hmm. So people from in North Lanarkshire, there's pretty much six different housing, and it'll be the same across the different areas. So we've got six different, there's, there's Coatbridge and Airdrie, so there's different towns across North Lanarkshire. There's not one main town. It's not like a Glasgow or Edinburgh, the city centre. So there's no one main town in North Lanarkshire. So there's six pretty much different housing markets. Cumberland all been extremely different as well from other parts. Um, but behaviours in the past, people would have kept to their own area. What we're finding now is people from Airdrie, when they're seeing new builds in Wisher, then they're actually, and that's what I'm saying, they're, they're actually following new build sites. Right. So where people are seeing council new build sites going on, then they're actually, their application's been moved. So right. people can apply for any area, but they're jumping about. But probably we have created a bit of an expectation because the houses, the new houses we've built over the last, mm. what, seven years are all front and back doors. So it's, it's created an aspiration to a certain extent and an expectation. Going forward, because of difficulties with land, we will require to build more flats again, but it's making sure that in a bigger site that we have a better mix. So there might be a couple of blocks of flats with cottage flats, with cottages as well. Um, but going forward, we'll definitely have to do that. Right. But it seems to be it's something that I think North Lanarkshire should be kind of created. Yeah, OK. Um, and my other question is around planning. Um, so it was a question that came up in the previous panel around the fact that um, developers might get planning permission, but they're not actually moved forward with housing. Uh, development and one of the responses, I think, I think it might have been Ken Gibb, said that some kind of proportional property tax for land with permission would be a good use of getting getting that housing to actually move forward. Do you face that kind of issue in your areas where you, because because one of the threads that came through yes, in the earlier session was that planning was a problem, but maybe there's some an aspect of planning where permission has been granted but the housing isn't moving forward. just wondered what it's like, Stephen and then Edward. So there are definitely sites in North Lanarkshire. The Chief Officer for Planning, Pamela Humphreys, in North Lanarkshire, we had this discussion last week, so there are absolutely some sites in North Lanarkshire where planning consent, pretty big sites as well, has been granted, and developers, for a variety of reasons, have chosen at the moment not to, not to actually start building. OK. Edward. And the same applies in Murray, and particularly within our biggest towns of Elgin and Bucky. Um, it's about the economics, you know, ultimately of uh, the aspirant market price, and there's no disincentive to holding on for that to change for the for the builders. Um, an inhibition would be, you know, we don't have the funding to take them forward in affordable housing, because sometimes we would be offered an alternative on those, and at the moment we can't do that. 
and it would help with overall housing supply, not within the social sector, to get those built out regardless. And right. if there was any fiscal disincentive to do so, I think that wouldn't be unhelpful. Okay. Great. Thanks very much. And I see out of the corner of my eye an indication from Willie Coffey that he wants to come in with a very, very brief question, <laughs> and then we'll wrap up. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, one of the issues I faced for many years as a local councillor when people were looking for a house was the inability to do mutual exchange automatically or using your advanced software that I know you have. Have we made any progress in that? Because I was struck by what Stephen said a wee minute ago there. He said you get 15,000 in the waiting list, 5,000 homeless, so there's 10,000 folk sitting in a house that want a different one. Is there a feature within your, your software systems that allow people to identify potential mutual exchanges for themselves rather than expecting the officers of the council to do that trawling and searching for them? Yeah, I'm happy to correctly come in. Yes, there's an online system in North Lanarkshire. Is it as good as it should be? I would suggest it's not at the moment, and it continues to be developed, but people can try and match to each other in terms of how size and how tight that people are looking for, yes. Any others? We have an exactly this type system available for people to identify possibilities of mutual exchange, and we would encourage that through our housing options approach. Good. Uh, Edward. Yeah, we, also have, uh, we have 660 on our transfer list at the moment. We also you know, sort of, uh, incentivise downsizing, particularly to free up large family homes. Mm -hmm. And we've got a downsizing officer who focuses on that. So it, it, it's a lot of work, though, uh, in terms of trying to match make and to get those moves through. Okay. okay. Thanks okay. very much. Thanks. I think that concludes our, our questions. Thanks so much for joining us uh, well, it's not. Well, we're still in the morning. Just, um, it's been actually very, very helpful to hear from you on your perspectives around uh, housing emergency, whether you have one or not, whether you might be going there, what what contributes to that, and how we can turn it around. So it's been a pleasure to have you join us this morning. Many, many thanks. And I'm now going to briefly suspend the committee um, for so that you can leave the room. The next item on our agenda for today is consideration of the following negative instruments. Town and Country Planning Master Plan, Master Plan Consent Areas, Scotland Regulations 2024, and the Town and Country Planning Amendment of Local Development Plan, Scotland Regulations 2024. And the committee considered these instruments as part of a package of instruments at its meeting last week when it took evidence from the Minister for Public Finance. And at that time, the committee agreed to reflect on the evidence it had heard and return to them, uh, return them to this agenda this week. And as these are negative instruments, there's no requirement for the committee to make any recommendations. So just ask if any other members have uh, any comments on the instruments. Okay. So um, I think I was quite keen to reflect on them and have a bit of time to, for reflection. And just in the case of the um, amendment of the local development plan, I think that's very welcome. Um, it was good to hear the Minister for Public Finance make a point that this could be an opportunity for local place plans that haven't yet been developed uh, and for communities to be able to bring them forward um, through that kind of amending process. So it was heartened to hear that. And in terms of the master consent areas, again, I welcome the streamlining, but I think it's very important that we um, ensure that that streamlining doesn't um, override 
the requirements to attend to a kind of urgent issue around biodiversity and that being kind of a prior um, a primary and priority policy in the national planning framework. So I just wanted to get that on the record that on, while master plan consent area is important in terms of some of the issues we've been talking about this morning, housing and infrastructure, we cannot forget that we have got a degraded biodiversity that we need to actually make sure we attend to. Otherwise, we're going to have um, knock-on problems for future generations. So, with that, is the committee agreed that we do not wish to make any other recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Okay. Thanks very much. And we previously agreed to take the next items in private, so as that was the last public item on our agenda today, I now close the public part of the meeting.